ladies, and a few gentlemen, good morning. First of all, I would like for each and every one of you to give yourselves a resounding round of applause. Yes, we have done it and we continue to do it. Secondly, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please look into your palms. Open your palm. Just open your palm. Look at it. Look at it. Open your palm and look at it. In your palm, hold the direction of your life. In your palm, hold the destiny of your life. In your palm, you can see, and you don't have to go to a soothsayer, you can see where your life is going. And I dare say that this is a moment when I say that destiny really does belong to the world's women. The world's women who suffer, the world's women who cry, the world's women who do all the unthinkables, the world's women who face online terrorism, the world's women who face sexual assault, that destiny belongs to us in this room. And for the next 30 seconds, I want each and every one of us to remember why we do what we do and for whom we do it. 15 seconds. Why do you do what you do and for whom do you do it? And now look at the lady next to you. If your seat is empty, find somebody else. And say, you are what the world has been waiting for. Go ahead. You are exactly what the world has been waiting for. Look to the lady next to you. You are what the world has been waiting for. And now that that is done, and we've acquainted ourselves with each other, ladies. My name is Anita Erskine, and I come to you from the Black Star of Africa. My mother is here, so I will say I come to you from the sister of Nigeria. I come to you from Ghana. And you are warmly welcome, warmly welcome. And today we're having a series of conversations. Before I go to introduce our opening remarks, just a few notes. I want to kindly ask that we refrain from taking pictures in this room, especially during the sessions. I want to also ask that we not cross the path to the main door. Please use the back doors behind you if you have to exit the building. And I kindly want to ask that throughout the day today, you give our sisters, our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunties, the biggest and the wildest resounding round of applause whenever we have the opportunity. The first round of applause belongs to the celebration of the 10th anniversary of women political leaders. Yes, 10 years. The second round of applause belongs to the 10th anniversary of the Women Political Leaders Summit in the European Parliament. And the third belongs to the world's women for whom you are representing today. With that said, I would like to invite our three presidents. Belgium has set the path, has set the example two women presidents representing the federal parliaments. This is the world we're looking for. President of Ghana, president of Nigeria, all being women one day, one day in our lifetime. And of course, the president in our lifetime while we're alive. And of course, the president of none other than the women political leaders and the founder. So ladies, with that being said, our official opening remarks, please allow me to present President of the Senate of Belgium, Stephanie Dose. She'll be followed by President of the House of Representatives of Belgium, Eliane Tillieu. And finally, but definitely not the least, President and Founder of Women Political Leaders, Sylvana koch merin Please ladies, the podium and the world is all yours. Wow, ladies, what a welcome. Dear Madam Presidents, dear 
fellow women political leaders, dear sisters, and a few brothers. I am very pleased, but very, very pleased to welcome you all at my, our Belgium Senate for the first day of the WPL Summit. Today's program will focus on the representation of women, violence against women, and sexism in politics. And I am sure, I am convinced that we are all experts by experience in these domains, unfortunately. Not too long ago, I shared one of my personal stories on national television. And I will share that now with you. I was 22 years old when I started my career behind the scenes of politics. And um, during a meeting, a government member told me that I could work for him if I passed the so-called pencil test. You know, ladies, if you don't know what the pencil test is, I didn't know that, so don't worry. To do the pencil test, you have to put a pencil under your breasts. And if it stays put, it means you have saggy breasts, and it means you failed the test. And it means I couldn't work for the member of the government. Obviously, ladies, I didn't take this so-called test. But um, I was shocked. And uh, if I look at your faces, I think you are shocked too. But uh, I will always remember it. I will always remember it as one of my first brush-ins with the deep-rooted sexist sentiments in politics. And I quickly learned that sexism is all around us, especially in places, of course, where there is power, where there are power dynamics. And of course, like always, women suffer most. It is still one of the main causes of female representation and the enduring problem of violence against women. And it happens in private life and in public life. Ladies, 26%, 26% is the current global percentage of female MPs, 26%. So it means, based on calculations, that it would take 40 years to reach full gender equality in Parliament at the current pace, 40 years. So that means in 2063, we are finally there. So this means also that almost two generations of women will remain underrepresented. Two generations of women, and this is actually un unacceptable. And here in Belgium, since the last elections, an important momentum was created in the political history of our country, and we are so proud of that. Thank you for that. We achieved several important milestones. For the first time, we had a female prime minister. The federal government is fully parity-based, and half of the parliaments in Belgium are shared by women, and for the first time, two women. Thank you. Two women were appointed speaker of the chamber and president of the Senate. However, However, sisters, all these steps should not make us believe that the final goal has been reached and that everything has been acquired. Of course not. It is important to point out that without quotas, and now we are talking about the quotas, without quotas, I probably wouldn't be here with you today. It is quite possible that without quotas, once again, there will be almost no women among us. And if quotas and all other measures that you are taking would disappear overnight, it wouldn't take long, I'm for sure, it wouldn't take long that our parity will melt down like snow in the sun. I see also another threat. The so-called, and you know them all, the anti-gender movements. These movements claim that gender equality, that is... It has been achieved. It means also that further research, that further action, that it is stupid. 
these anti-gender actors may also argue that pro-gender movements put men's social status under threat and pro-women's and also rainbow rights are a form of political correctness. As such, anti-gender movements do not only threaten the rights of women and people, I am convinced they threaten and they undermine our democracy. And it seems that these movements have ramifications on a global level and they are also funded on a transnational level. So, we must be vigilant and we must know equality before the law is now a reality in our country and I hope in the most of the countries in the European Union. But we cannot say the same for equality in practice. Some mentalities, they remain outdated and show absolutely no intention to change. We see the evidence all around us in different forms every day. And five years ago, five years ago, we had a simple tweet inviting women to use the phrase hashtag me too. It went viral. It unleashed public accusations against some women and men for sexual misconduct. Since the hashtag me too era, elected officials, mostly men, have been forced to leave office. Hashtag me too opened the debate. Hashtag me too opened many eyes. It brought hope, it brought change in terms of gender equality. But of course, ladies, sisters, in this federal parliament, we do not stop there. We do not accept the fact that women are just victims. That narrative has absolutely no place here. Our parliament has produced several information reports and taken many, many more initiatives to remain and to remedy certain social inequalities, both here and abroad. We help women become agents of change, individuals in charge of their own future, from victims to victors. The role of us, presidents and MPs, is to put pressure, to put constant pressure on our governments to achieve full, full gender equality. Let's continue that doing today, tomorrow, together. And we have an important day ahead of us, including interesting panel discussions and keynote speeches. I wish you all a very, very lovely day in our house. Thank you so much. And now, ladies, President of the House of Representatives of Belgium, Madame Eliane Tillieu. Thank you very much, distinguished presidents, dear fellows, women political leaders, esteemed guests, guests, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure that I welcome you to our parliament for this summit organized jointly by the Senate and the women political leaders. Ten years ago, the International Network of Women Politician Leaders was founded in Brussels. This anniversary is also an opportunity for us to assess the situation of women in politics. Over the last 10 years, the number of women active in politics has risen steadily. And the Belgian parliament is currently setting an example. The proportion of women in the chamber has risen from 12% in 95 to just over 42% in 19 <laughs> compared with a world average of 25%. Of course, women becoming increasingly involved in politics is not enough for the status of all women to change. That's why our Assembly's Advisory Committee on Social Emancipation is working across the board to improve women's everyday life. The members of this committee have drawn up resolutions on domestic violence, female entrepreneurship, single mothers, 
the political landscape is gradually moving towards greater equality. Women now occupy positions traditionally reserved for men. We don't need to look very far to find examples. For the first time in its history, our country has two women presiding over a bicameral parliament. Yeah. This is the case in only three other countries in the world. Argentina, the Bahamas, and Belize. Similarly, the current Belgian federal government has appointed women to head two ministries that had previously been held by men exclusively. I say defense and foreign affairs. Our government is also made up of equal number of men and women for the first time. This is a major premiere in our country and demonstrate our determination to make it a permanent feature, feature in the future. Despite all these advances, the glass ceiling remains a reality. Today, our discussions will focus on possible solutions. In particular, the many studies on women's representation have identified the lack of women's network as an obstacle to greater representation of women in assemblies. It is clear that an individual social network plays a role, a key role, in a career path. As a network such as women political leaders strengthens the place and role of women in parliaments, promotes experience exchanges, and encourages solidarity between women. I am sure that belonging to a network also creates an alliance between its members, uniting them closely, offering them invaluable opportunities to thrive in the position they occupy. Ladies, fellow women political leaders, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the summit for their initiative and for the gathering together, which I hope this gathering will be rich in ideas, food for thought, and debate. I hope that our discussions will give rise to innovative and relevant projects to improve the lives of women and build a more balanced society that respects gender issues. Thank you for your attention. Please welcome President and Founder of Women Political Leaders, Silvana koch -Mirin. Good morning, ladies, lady sisters, as Stephanie called you, um, dear friends, excellencies, and um, yeah, just really overwhelming to see you here in this room after the wonderful day and important day yesterday in the European Parliament. Now a very, very different Parliament, different topics. And let me start by expressing a big thank you to our two co-hosts, Stephanie and Eliane. It's wonderful to know that you're the two highest representatives of this country and um, that you welcome us in your gilded rooms. Uh, it's a very, very special day. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank you, Stephanie, for your opening words. I didn't prepare this to say um, initially in my opening remarks, but I'd like to thank you for your courage and for your openness. It does take courage to talk about those stories, and those stories, they need to be told. They need to get out in the open, because I'm sure each and every one of us has experiences some are more drastic, some are less drastic than what you described. And in the current political setup, most of us individualize it, say, this happens to me and I don't talk about it. 
I get on with it. I develop a thicker skin. I just become tougher. I find my ways to defend myself. But in this past 10 years, we've come across so many untold stories that we said there is something deeply wrong in the way politics are today. And that's why we went to see one of the champions of this kind of openness, Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister of Australia, who you probably all know has been very, very openly talking about things that happened to her while she was becoming Prime Minister, while she was Prime Minister, and also in the, in the weeks afterwards. And she has now set up an institute at King's College focusing on women's leadership. And together, we conducted a study and presented it uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos Week this year, where we looked at the systemic barriers for women in politics. And this is truly global because we had responses from women in political office from almost 70 countries. And it shows that 85% experience online violence, online harassment, often sexualized. More than 10% experience physical violence in the job. And we also collected other elements, stories of incidents like what you describe, Stephanie. And this is happening to the most powerful women of the world, also when TV cameras are present. You might recall what Politico, and we're happy to have Politico as a media partner, called Sofagate. Sofagate happened to one of the most powerful women of the world, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. She was on a state visit to Turkey to meet the Turkish president, and with her, of course, was the president of the European Council, a man. And when there was the official final photo to be taken, there were two seats only. Two seats only, and immediately the two men took those seats. And they asked her, you can sit on the sofa. There is a sofa on the sidelines. This was when the world cameras were there, when one of the most powerful women of the world was on an official visit, and she was asked to take the side seat, the sofa. This caused quite some uproar here in Brussels. The European Parliament had a debate about this, was titled Sofagate. And again, we began also looking into who has similar stories. And for example, the former president of uh, Ecuador, when she was handing over to her successor, um, a small, well, also some kind of sofa gate happened because she's quite tall, not as tall as me, but very tall. And her successor was much smaller. So they said, well, we can't have them stand next to each other. This will make the new president look inferior. So let's sit them down. As it happens, she was also seated taller. Then they said, okay, let's make the, the, the legs of the chair shorter so that in the picture, she would look smaller than him. Latin America, a different continent, but the same systems behind this. And that's part of what we're here to handle, to deal with. We need to stop thinking it's our personal problem, because it isn't. It's a systemic problem. It's a problem that women as public leaders experience very strongly because we're out there. You are out there, you're in the media, you're out on social media because it's part of your job. So you experience this very strongly. But every woman everywhere else experiences this kind of marginalizing, always having to look out for a safe space, thinking of ways on how to counter such insults, comments, attacks. And we need to end this. We want to end this for our daughters, for our grandchildren, for us. Answering your question, Anita, why are we doing this job? So, this is what this day is about. We will discuss this. We will find ways to go forward collectively. And um, 
Let me finish with a quote from Michel Bachelet, the former president, two times president of Chile and the first executive director of UN Women because she phrased this in a very, very compact way. She said, when one woman is a politician, it changes her. When many women are politicians, it changes policies and politics. Thank you. And now we move to our first keynote speech of the morning. Please welcome back to the podium Her Excellency Eliane Tillieu, President of the House of Representatives of Belgium, to give her opening key remarks. Dear colleagues, let's go back 25 years ago to 19. 98. Do you know what the percentage of women in parliaments worldwide was at this time? Do you know? What was the percentage this time? No? 11, yeah. 11%. 11. Women's political representation in the world has doubled in the last 25 years, currently reaching 26.5%. That's right, in today's parliament, only about one member in four is a woman. In other words, more than three quarters of the seats are held by men. Yet, equitable participation and leadership of women in political and public life are essential if we are to achieve a sustainable development goals by 2030. Nevertheless, the data show that women are still underrepresented at all, level, or all levels of power around the world and that gender parity is still far from being achieved in political life. Faced with this persistent situation, of which we all are aware, measures have been taken to improve the representation of women in politics and, more broadly, to ensure that they are better integrated in society. In terms of legal framework, Belgium has, for example, taken legal measures to include more women in the political landscape. In 1994, with the law prohibiting political parties from drawing up electoral lists with more than two-thirds of members of the same sex, and in 2002, with the amendment to the Belgian Constitution, stipulating that women and men are equal and that equal access to political mandates is guaranteed. All executive bodies, government, college of aldermen, and so on, must at least be mixed. In addition, electoral legislation has been amended to impose balanced representation. Lists must include as many men and women and the first two candidates may not be of the same gender. For some federated entities, the principle of rotation is already applied to all lists. So you have, if you have one man, you have women, men, women, men, women, men. Or women, men, women, men, women, men, the same. The main obstacles to women's political involvement remains sexism in politics, the invisibility of mandates, and combining, of course, work and family life. Political parties clearly have a great role to play, since it's through them that citizens are democratically represented. 
In Belgium, most political parties have women's organizations or networks, whether formal or informal. Some comparable initiatives are not linked to any particular party. I am thinking of the ne ne Nederlandstalige Vrouwenraad or the Conseil des Femmes Francophones de Belgique. It's all over parties. The role of these women's associations can be compared to that of catalysts, to trigger reactions by raising awareness, to promote mentality changes, and to inform, give information, simply, statistics sometimes. Nevertheless, I still believe that political parties need to invest even more in training, management programs, and other forms of mentoring. You know, in our um, public television, they had this uh, uh, remark that on the screen, you only saw men as expert, experts, it's talking about health, about uh, sustainable development, only men at the screen as experts. So they began to ask why. Why did women need not um, appear? And the question was, we had not enough time to go, yes, of course, because of family life, but also they didn't dare. They wouldn't like to, to be at the screen, to speak in the microphone, because they aren't used to it. And uh, television began to uh, organize training so that women, especially for women, experts, so that could be at ease with the microphone, with the screen, with the cameras, and so on. So they improve the rate of women appearing in these uh, television emissions. So it's, it's an example, I think. Politics can also influence representation a telling example concerns one of our country's highest courts. Article 31 of the Special Law of January 6, 1989 on the Constitutional Court stipulates that it must be made up of 12 judges, six from the academic um, world and six former members of parliament. Today, Five of these 12 judges are women, four of whom are for former members of parliament appointed alternatively by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Of course, you see the mark of women president. All of which goes to show that the political parties are already working towards real parity within the institutions. To improve the daily life of women, the federal government, which for the first time in history is made, of, is made up of equal members of numbers of men and women, and the House of Representatives have adopted a number of initiatives, two of which I would like to mention here today. The first concerns a specific women's health issue, the resolution on endometriosis. The members of the Committee on Health and Equal Opportunities organized hearings on the subject and came up with a text calling on the federal government to initiate a global consultation with the relevant ministers on the advisability and necessity of drawing up a national action plan against endometriosis. A specific disease of women. It is also uh, the opportunity to look at these uh, health questions concerning uniquely women. Another example in the fight against feminicide. Last year, 24 women died in Belgium just because of their gender. In 2020, as you may know, one of these women was a local elected representative, the mayor of Aalst. A framework will, bill 
on feminicide has been tabled by the federal government and was passed yesterday by the Health Committee and voted, approved. <laughs> the aim is to evaluate the situation and mandate the Institute for Gender Equality to gather data and make progress on this issue and make re recommendations since the start of this legislature, we have adopted strong measures to guarantee the protection of women who are victims of violence. For example, the budget for outpatient services spe specializing in the care of victims of violence has tripled three times more, more uh, financial support. 100 shelter places have been created for victims of domestic violence and the domestic violence helpline has been reinforced. May I also remind you that, that Belgium has ratified the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Belgium is committed to eliminating all forms of discrimination against women by adopting me measures of respect, protect, and implement, implement all the rights contained in the Convention at national level. It will have to submit a report to a committee of experts who will check whether the rights set out in the Convention are respected and implemented. In the House, the Advisory Committee on Social Emancipation organized a debriefing session with the Belgian delegation that presented uh, the report. On 8 March 22, International Women's Rights Day, the President of the Senate, Stephanie, and I called on the U European Union as a legal entity to ratify the Istanbul Convention. This was done on June 1st, 2023, and I would like to welcome this accession, finally, at European level. Our institutions want to show their resolves. resolve. On March 8th, we presented the results of an audit that Stephanie and I launched via an, via an internal working group on the issue, issue of gender equality within our federal parliament. The idea was to determine the extent to which gender equality is achieved in all levels of our organization, at the political level, but also at the level of its internal organization. Our ambition is to make the Federal Parliament of Belgium one of the most gender-aware parliaments in Europe by 2030. <laughs> the conclusions and recommendations point the way to concrete action to improve the situation and advance the representation of women in politics. We must dare to move forward and push open doors that have remained closed until now. Last week, the board of the Chamber of Representatives decided to promote gender equality within its administration by amending the staff regulations and choosing the candidate of the least represented gender for each new position in its departments given equal skills, of course. I would also like to highlight one measure in particular, that of empowerment. This concept is not new. It has its roots in the Afro-American movements. As early as 1985, women's movements in Latin America and the Caribbean were championing the notion of empowerment. It's about grabbing power, which means boosting self-esteem. 
self-confidence and be able to choose the direction of one's life, as you saw when we enter this room. It's also a question of our collective power to change gender relations in economic, political, legal, social, cultural domains. The Beijing Conference adopted this concept of empowerment in 95, presenting it as a key development strategy. Empowerment policies can be implemented in a variety of ways through citizenship education, support of organizations supporting women, encouraging women, especially young girls, to take part in actions and support entrepreneurship. This issue of entrepreneurship was included in the Europe 2020 strategy and the House of Representatives Committee of Advice on Social Emancipation adopted a resolution on the same subject. In particular, the resolution provides for the promotion of tailor-made entrepreneurship among women and in this respect, the deconstruction and active fight against all gender-related cliché, both in social life and in business world. These policies should enable women to become aware of their talents, they free themselves and develop new skills. Confidence in oneself and one's potential is the first step before acting, becoming politically active and a role model for others. Ladies, fellow colleagues, equal representation is a rising issue, but still has a long way to go. Unfortunately, this message had to be repeated too often. It's now up to us to act to ensure that all women around the world realize their potential, commit themselves in their own way to equality. Let me close by quoting Stendhal. The excess of women to perfect equality would be the surest mark of civilization and it would, be, it would double the intellectual forces of the human race. Dear colleagues, let's turn this conditionality into a reality and together let's work towards an emancipating, emancipating respectful and inclusive society. Thank you. And right off, and right off the back of that, the question is, how do we then achieve these inclusive political environments? How do we have our voices heard? How do we get our influence felt? This brings us, and I hope the answers will be in our first panel discussion today, titled Representation Matters. And of course, beautifully moderated by Lucia Klesinkova, who is the co-president of Volt Slovakia. She will handle this conversation amongst the vice president of the Senate of Rwanda in the person of Esperance Nia Safari. We will also have the deputy chamber of deputies, Mexico, governor of Zacatecas, 2004 to 2010, in the person of Amelia Dolores Garcia Medina, and the member of chairwoman of, member and chairwoman of the Standing Committee on Human Rights and on equal opportunities between men and women, House of Representatives of Cyprus, Vice President of the OCSE Parliamentary Assembly, in the person of Irene Karalambides, and finally, definitely not the least, Chair and Co-Founder, the Reykjavik Global Forum, Senior Advisor, UN Women, Hannah Christens Dottir. <laughs> Ladies, please, the platform is yours.
Good morning, ladies. Are we on? <laughs> it's a big, big honor to feel the energy in the room and be here with you, ladies. Some of you may wonder who's this girl. I haven't seen her before because some of you have been. Does it work? No. Silvana telling me it doesn't work. La 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 la. Or can I steal the walking mic? Oh, seems like it was. Thank you for the signal. So once again, good morning, ladies. It's a huge honor to be here with you and guide you through this massively important conversation because yesterday we got all hyped up as we usually are at this forum about how it's important to stand for each other and feel the sisterhood, except we aren't the ones who need to be persuaded about it, right? We are not the ones who need to be preached about what's the business case for gender equality in all areas of our society. And so it's a big, big honor for me to dive deeper into the conversation about the how, especially because the WPL fora are such a precious resource for us to look into what has been working in the other cultural contexts and what can we take out of those experiences for the specifics that we live in. Obviously, it's a huge honor to moderate this panel in my new home, Belgium. I've been living here for a decade as a European official, working at the European Commission, partially also as a member of Commission DALI's task force. So it's a big stand for me, empowering women across all areas of society. Now I'm on sabbatical after my maternity leave because I've decided I also want to experiment with living a life on my own terms and empowering other women to do so as a speaker and coach and mentor. And also, I have the honor to be a co-president of Vault Slovakia. For those of you who've heard of Vault, maybe you've heard how gender equality is in the DNA of the party, which is why I've decided to say yes to this offer and explore the how. And that's why we're here, to also look into what the political parties can do to bring more women into the race, because let's be frank, I'd be curious to hear from all of you how it's been at the very beginning before you got the support of the party. When you were just feeling the calling somewhere deep within, that there is a bigger contribution you can bring to the societies, but it's obviously going to take loads of courage, and then obviously there's gonna be a big price that you will be paying with your privacy, with the lifestyle, with the purses, with career opportunities. So this is the context that the WPL has beautifully created for this conversation, and I'm honored to be joined here by our esteemed speakers. I would like to start with posing a question to dear Hannah. Obviously, Iceland and WPL have been living a beautiful partnership for a long time, Iceland being the leader for 13 years, leading the charts. And we can just wonder <laughs> what made it possible. <laughs> what is it in the culture or in the system or in the political commitments or in the policy structures that makes it possible for you to continue walking the talk and advancing in the ranks and just making it reality on an everyday basis. So for those of us who haven't been quite on top of the Icelandic story, what is the main lesson? Thank you so much. And I'm super glad to be here today and witnessing the 10th anniversary of WPL, which has been an amazing journey for many of us and I hope all of us. Uh, and WPL has worked, as you said, closely with the government and the parliament of Iceland. We host every year uh, in partnership what is called the Reykjavik Global Forum, where we mix women leaders from all sectors and have a really, really great conversation about what can be done. And I am not going to say, I could sit here and brag about the fact that Iceland has done so wonderfully and way better than everybody else, but we are a, a nation of 350,000 which sort of sets things into perspective. So please don't feel that we have done something that is unimaginable. When you come from way bigger and more complex cultures, it can be harder. But just to put it sort of the way I see it, I think Iceland shows the case of the fact that this can be done. Uh, I mean, when my mother was born and was growing up, there was no female member of parliament in Iceland. She never saw any female parliamentarians. It was just not in the culture or the country. When I grew up, she had me when she was 20. There was one woman in parliament when I was born. And in my sort of, when I was growing up, I saw one and two, usually the same ones. And I know their names still because they were sort of so 
few and far between in Icelandic politics. I have two daughters, 19 and 25, and they have lived in a reality, in a country, where half and half of the polit political figures and the decision makers are women. And that is not just accident. It's because Iceland decided that this was not only a matter of human rights and women's rights, but we decided that the economy couldn't flourish and grow without gender equality. So we see it as one of our main pillars of just managing and doing great and good for our people. And that is not just about the women getting opportunities in the workforce, it's also about the opportunity of men to be in not only a sort of professional role, but also a personal role. So I, I can tell you just from the moment where I realized that I'm actually in a country where gender equality sort of exceeds so many other things. This is, I have two kids, as I said earlier, and when they woke up in the middle of the night, wanting something or needing something from their parents, they were just as likely to call out for their father as for me. And this is where you realize we have made a difference. Something is totally changed. So I think Iceland has done that really well, but it has done as, I mean, we have here three parliamentarians, female parliamentarians from Iceland. They all come from different parties, but they agree on one thing, and that is the importance of gender equality for Iceland. So it's this amazing consensus around the issue. We are not always agreeing on the methods, but we agree that we need legislative reform. We have a progressive way of dealing with maternity leave, for example. We agree that exactly what, uh, and maybe I can sum it up like that. I mean, Iceland has realized the theme of this conference, that representation matters, and that is sort of at the heart of Iceland, its approach to policy and politics. But please, just know that Iceland is not a gender heaven or something like that. I mean, if Iceland has been number one for 13 years, it goes to show that the rest of the world is simply not doing well enough because we have not managed to still get it or get there. Yeah. I'd like to... I'd like to come back to my question, actually, if you could say in one sentence, what was really the enabler? What was the tipping point when you say your mother was growing up with no parliamentarians there, and then something happened which made it possible that in one generation's time the change happened? What was it really? It was Iceland voting for the first time in a democratic elections for a female president, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir, in 1981. This is where there was a total shift in the way we saw power and the way women were both sort of seen as active at the table, taking their space and place. And I mean, I don't know, there, I, I think if you would either ask an Icelander whether it's a woman or a man who is your sort of favorite public figure of all time, everybody would mention this. So I think that was the point of, of no return, if you like. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go to Rwanda. Esperance, you've also spent the past 30 years, I assume, explaining the Rwandan story, right? It's all sort of a case study for all of us looking into. My question is, if you could similarly touch upon what you, we kind of feel that the historical geographical context was different, right? For when the access for women to politics happened. But also, I'm wondering, how do you feel the narrative changed over the past decades? of the enablers of the country's stand for women empowerment, of all of you getting the why before we go into discussing what it made possible for policy making process. Looking back over the past, let's say, 30 years that you had a chance to observe, what was the change of the conversation that you feel might be valuable to take note of for those who are somewhere further still in their path of getting into the 61% that you have now in the parliament. Thank you so much. First of all, I uh, wish to congratulate WPL and wish you uh, the 10th uh, anniversary. Uh, and uh, I might say that I'm really happy to be with you today in the parliament of uh, Belgium, the Senate, so uh, we have to feel uh, comfortable and enjoying the 10th anniversary of WPL. And I might also thank uh, Silvana for being behind all the success uh, behind the WPL. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Rwanda, uh, it is only after the genocide against the Tutsi since 1994 when we, th we saw things changed. Before it wasn't the case. We had a few women in the power, but after the genocide, we, re we realized that being together is the only way to overcome challenges. Being united and including all parts of the societies can only uh, be the strength. So uh, women being excluded for a long time about uh, public uh, affairs, we had the chance to get a good leadership uh, led by the president, uh, the current president of the Republic, His Excellency Poro Kagame, who is uh, a, glob a he for she global champion. Uh, and together with uh, other actors of change, we started by changing norms, starting by the Constitution. And I might also say that quota matters because with the quota, uh, we happened to get more women in decision-making organs, namely parliament, government, and in the judiciary. Now uh, we have, 60, as you said, 61% of women MPs. We have them now. And in the Senate, we stand at 34%. Uh, 30, in the government, 45 women are ministers. In the judiciary, 51%. And in other um, making uh, decision-making organs, we have at least, we have to have at least 30% women as provided for in, uh, in the Rwandan constitution. So uh, having this and having also institutional arrangement that are there to mobilize women to understand that they have the same right as men, played a, a big role, and uh, w policies have been changed, have been changed because we have women in the power, but together with men, because we have to bear in mind that women's rights, gender equality is not only women's affairs, it is the society affair, because when women advance, the society benefits from it. So we have we, men who are alliers. Uh, an example of, uh, in parliament, we have the women forum, and men are also members of this women fo uh, forum. So meaning that together we work toward gender equality, and we strive to change mindset because uh, cultural uh, behavior still hamper the advancement of uh, uh, gender equality. And uh, yesterday we talked about uh, education. We make sure that girls and boys have the same right in terms of education. Women matters. Women representation matters, yes, because women representation has influenced to get gender sensitive laws. I can mention the inheritance law that was enacted in 1999. Before, the, the, the inheritance was only for boys. Women, girls could not inherit their parents Culturally, it was uh, th that uh, only men and boys could inherit. But with this women's representation, which influenced the enactment of this law, women now can, and girls can now inherit their parents. 
women can own land at the same level as men. They can see their names registered, uh, getting titles under their names. But this, is not, this was not the case before 1994. So I, in conclusion, the political will is very important, but also a conducive environment in terms of legal, uh, gender sensitive laws, gender policies are all the enabler to lift women in all spheres of life, not only in the politics, but also in the business, in the media, in so, and the Senate, one of the mandate of the Senate is to, 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 do, to, to oversee whether this is being implemented by all actors uh, in, the, in the society. And uh, uh, I think the theme is, real, is the reality in Rwanda, but everywhere it can be a reality. But we still have challenges. Challenges are still there. Maybe we will talk about uh, these challenges uh, uh, later. Thank you. Thank you. Amalia, I would like to ask you um, a similar question about the enablers. But also, we've already opened the quota Pandora box in the previous remarks. Obviously, Mexico has been uh, far ahead also in this story. I was wondering, following on Stefani Dio's uh, comment, if we remove the quota and the gender equality is gone as well, what is your thinking about the conversation and the enablers that made it possible for quota to be introduced? And what is your thinking about when does gender equality become the new normal so that we can actually stop caring about whether they stay or not? because it has become so embedded in our society as in Iceland or probably Rwanda as well. Thank you. Very, very glad to be here in uh, this conference because, uh, uh, it, can you listen? No. Yes. Uh, very glad to be here in this conference because uh, we really want uh, to share our uh, experiences. Uh, and I would say that uh, in uh, Mexico, uh, we have gone very, very much ahead. Uh, when I listen uh, to what is happening here in Belgium, for me it was uh, very impressive because uh, we began in Mexico with quotas. And uh, after wars, we went to affirmative action. But uh, in uh, 2014, uh, we made a reforming constitution so that uh, Congresses, not only the national Congress, but also local Congresses, would be 50% women, 50% men. But uh, the question we ask all of us, not only Congresswomen uh, uh, from uh, all political parties, but also the feminist movement that in Mexico is very, very powerful, uh, civic society, uh, women uh, uh, in the media, we ask if we are 50%, why should we only 50% in Congress? We must go to other places. And uh, uh, in uh, 2019, a constitutional reform was approved in Mexico for parity in everything, in every uh, one of the three branches of power. Uh, we already have uh, this uh, parity, 50-50 uh, in Mexican Congress, but uh, now we are advancing in parity in federal government in uh, state government, in municipalities government, and also in the judiciary uh, power, so that all branches of power are 50-50%. What made that possible? The uh, assumption that uh, uh, women, uh, we make uh, things different. Wh when uh, I was invited to be panelist uh, uh, here uh, in, uh, in the discussion about representation matters, the question was how do politics change with women in power? How do they change with us in power? And uh, the answer is uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, constructing a different kind of power, not authoritarian power, 
not a power to control or to subordinate uh, because domination is a patriarchal way of exercising power. We do not want to dominate. And uh, what we want is to deconstruct the culture of domination and uh, control. Women in plural, not one woman, not I myself, but all women, we must be uh, deciding and we must be in power. Uh, so that is why we pass from quotas to affirmative action and now to parity in all, as we say, in Mexico. And the question is, parity for what? What do we want to do uh, with parity? Uh, and how do we behave? In the first place, we say that uh, women from all political parties, we united and we have had uh, several reforms. For example, our budget. The budget in Mexico uh, is a budget with a, a, a perspective agenda so that uh, uh, all uh, the money that goes uh, to public actions must have this uh, perspective agenda. For example, in health, women and men, we do not live different, but also we die for different issues. Men usually die because they have an accident, because uh, they have a fight among them, but women, we mostly die because of our health, because uh, uh, we, are, we do not have health. So the budget must have perspective, gender, uh, vision, so that every cent uh, has this uh, vision uh, and we have it there. Mm, but uh, what we want to do is uh, uh, to, to have a, a, a vision so that uh, we can uh, change the situation of women. Uh, several uh, days ago, 10 days ago, and uh, here we ha I have my Mexican friends uh, who are from different political parties, but uh, all of us united uh, so that uh, a proposal, a reform in constitution was approved. We call it three for three. What does it mean, three for three? This uh, reform in constitution, it means that uh, in the first place, a, uh, n not a man, n no man could be a candidate or public official if he uh, is uh, having violent uh, uh, behavior in family. If a man is uh, violent, uh, if he exercises violence in his family, cannot be candidate and he cannot go in public office. On the second place, if a man is not paying uh, the, his obligation for food and maintenance of his children when he is divorced or separated, he cannot be elected as a candidate and he cannot be public official. Uh, and uh, if a man uh, is a, a, a political uh, gender aggressive, he cannot be candidate and he cannot go to a public office. Three for three. This was just approved 10 days ago in Mexico. Of course, you can say, how could that be approved? Because women from all political parties, uh, women uh, uh, in Congress, women uh, in the social movement, uh, in the press, uh, judges, women judges, we united and we had men, uh, as, I, as, as we say in Spanish, contra la pared, against the wall. Uh, because now it is very difficult to openly say that you do not agree with women's movement. It is not politically correct. So we have uh, now achieved the possibility to, to be uh, uh, in uh, the uh, situation uh, where we are struggling against violence. And why are we struggling against violence? But with, because, and I'm going to finish, violence is not only in war. Many women silently uh, live uh, domestic violence, rape, uh, hitting, beating, uh, and uh, we must speak out. Uh, we must say that this is unbearable. We cannot uh, accept this violence in Mexico, in my country, and I am very, very uh, heard to say this, uh, about uh, 11 women are killed in uh, 
uh, every day, 11 women. And most of the killers are husbands, boyfriends, somebody who know them. Uh, this is unbearable. That is why no man uh, who is violent can go to uh, public service because public service must be a service of ethics. Uh, if you want to serve uh, uh, the people, you must begin at your own home with those who are near to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. We will move to Cyprus, um, where, and, and this is a ma an amazing transition from the gender-based violence into the complicated also security context that you've experienced in the region and now by extension the whole Europe, right? And this has been the context of the conversation yesterday. Would we be leaving this context, the whole geopolitical challenge that we're now discussing, if there was gender equality in politics, if there was more feminine leadership in policy making process? So I'd be very curious to hear what's your thoughts on what you've heard in terms of the enablers? How can more gender-based representation enable different responses to the security challenges that we're facing now? And also specifically in Cyprian um, context, we're speaking eight women in your current problem because by sheer size, I'm wondering with the same, you have 14%, I think. That, the same more or less proportion, if we look at India, it's one zero more. And so I wonder, what does it mean in terms of creating the alliances among women who may sometimes be from different parts of the political spectrum? Does the sheer size and the, the numbers of the sisterhood that you can count on make it more complicated for you to embed this new culture into your political culture? First of all, I'm really glad being among so fantastic, beautiful women from all over the world. And I was really happy to have you and you calling us sisters. Yes, because we are sisters united and we are going to face the challenges all together. I'm coming from a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean. That causes lots of troubles, especially with all this gas in the area. So we've got a big share when it comes to conflicts as politicians and as a mother. I'm a mother of two. Both my sons served in the army. And I have to tell you that my island, even it's small, is divided. And we women in Cyprus, Greek Cypriot women, Turkish Cypriot women, united. We are trying to find a solution because we don't want to see our boys, one facing the other with the guns in their hands, killing each other. We gave birth to them. We want them to be alive, healthy, and having a prosperous life. So women are facing great challenges in Cyprus. And we are fighters. We've learned how to fight on both communities. Now, I have to say that I grew up in a patriarchal society. Even in 2013, when the president of Cyprus was elected, he didn't feel that he had to appoint any women in his cabinet. But then, we had a turnover because we rebelliated the women and we started accusing him. So he had to reform the cabinet and appoint women. We have very strong women in Cyprus and we might only be eight in the parliament at the moment, but each one of us is a fighter. And because of that, and because we wanted to push men in the corner, no matter which political party we belong to, we are united. And especially in the Human Rights um, Commission, uh, Committee, where I chair, we are all united. And when we put a target, we uh, have results. And of course, this is a headache for the men in, uh, in the parliament. <laughs> Now, 
Sorry? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, uh, it's a great compliment. But because of living in a patriarchal um, society, we had to prove ourselves twice uh, men do. And we, have, we had to fight harder. And we had a great share of uh, sexist, sexist behavior in the parliament to deal with. But we did. And I want to, because before uh, we talked about quotas, in Cyprus, we do not have quotas. There are some uh, parties, they are for quotas, some others they are against. I've got a question for all of you, and I need an answer. In my opinion, when you have a quota, this undermines in the conscience of the citizens that this woman was not elected because of her power, because of her beliefs, because she's a fighter, she was elected because the party and the, and the law put her there and we had to vote for her. This is the only question I have in mind concerning quotas. Because if you find your own way to the top, no matter how many fights you have to give, then you are a true winner and people have faith in you, they vote of you, they vote for you, and they believe in you. I have to tell you that in my country, I am the first woman who managed for the very first time in Cyprus history to get elected twice at the national parliamentary election, first in votes from all MPs, no matter which party uh, and and this, this was a success for all women in Cyprus. The, a message went through that enough is enough with the men. We need women as leaders. And this is the message, I think, that um, it's going along uh, the world. In OSCPA, uh, the Organization for Safety and Security in Europe, uh, we are um, about 350 parliamentarians for 57 parliaments along the world. We are only 35% women. We are only two vice presidents among the seven. And when I try to suggest an amendment forcing delegations to include women, you have no idea how much resistance I had to deal with it. And I'm not sure this amendment will go through because I believe that in each delegation, we must have women representing their countries. And that's why I also tried to push forward two more amendments concerning gender balances. Um, when we have observation missions, when we have activities, the president to be forced if he has as a leader a man, then to have a vice a woman, or a leader a woman, a vice a man. And I think in the international organizations, we have also to give a fight about this. We must demand women to have a share fair of power in the international organizations. Yes, you want to ask me something? Okay, please, move on. Thank you. We don't have much time. Obviously, this is massively inspiring, and I would love to ask 20 questions as a follow-up to each of you. Now, we'll try to be effective and go to the last block, which is about what can political parties do to make sure that the women are on ballot? Because by the time, there's a lot of decisions that we have to all take before we actually end up on the list, right? There's going to be panels dedicated specifically to the question may, of sexism may, and online violence. May I, before we move on, because I left something, I really want to mention it. Okay. One of my favorite ladies is Madeleine Albright. Let me quote her, word by word. I think it's important for all of you to hear. Madeleine said, for women in power, can be counted on to raise issues that others overlook, to support ideas that others oppose, and to seek an end to abuses that others accept. 
I think this sums it up. I also remember Madeleine Albright quoting my country, the black hole of Europe, because of the political leadership it was having several decades ago. Now we live a different reality, and my question is what can each of us do as we go home, as political leaders that you are, to make sure that there's going to be women presenting themselves as candidates for your list, because obviously you will have panels dedicated to online violence and sexism directed at the candidates, but there's a long road for a woman to arrive at the place where she's harassed online, because there's difficult decisions and support that needs to arrive in her sort of space so that she can have the courage, she can have the guts, she can have the clarity, she can have the teams. And frankly, the big taboo in the room that I feel hasn't been addressed is the money that it takes for a woman to afford to run. Any decision for all of us to get involved in politics means we need to outsource care. We need to stop working, right? And so for all of us, my question is, what is going to be the homework for us that we're going to pass on as a message to the parties? And for all of you, it's one minute question. What do you feel that the parties can do as an addition to what they've already been doing to start with? I'm going to ask with Esperance. Um, yeah, in your context, in your cultural context, what do you feel the parties can do to get even more women on the ballots? Well, uh, in my country, uh, political parties are doing well because uh, we have a legal framework that oblige political parties to have also at least 30% yeah. of uh, women in their uh, decision-making uh, organs. So uh, the Constitution of Rwanda in its Article 56 uh, stipulates that uh, political organization must always reflect the unity of Rwandans as well as equality and complementarity of men and women in the recruitment of members, in establishing their leadership organs, and in their functioning and activities. And the organic law on political organizations and the politicians, uh, in its Article 7, each political organization shall have at least 30% of post in decision-making organs awarded to women. And this is being implemented. So I can encourage uh, political parties to have more women in the leadership, in the list of candidates, of MPs. And this is workable in Rwanda. We are not really, we are okay with political parties, but we have always to keep an eye on uh, implementation of these uh, provisions. That's what I can say. Yes. Yeah, and uh, accountability is key. We can have good provisions, but when you are not accountable, it's really uh, in theory. So we have to see this in practical terms. And the Senate is there to, 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 to oversee whether this is being uh, implemented. I apologize to everybody. We'll have to cut this panel short in order to give floor to Madam Commissioner. I'll just give one sentence, possibly to Hannah. Please tell us how we can all support the work of you and women. Thank you so much. I would just like to, because you mentioned sort of what can, we can leave in the room for us to take back. Uh, and of course, we would want to have longer conversations around that, but I would like to sort of suggest that we sort of take to our home countries the fact that we need to globally support gender equality. It's not enough for us to sit in this room and talk about it. And as you mentioned earlier, it is about money. And we have the, in my opinion, the most important international organization for this work is of course you and women. And we need to make sure that our governments and our parliaments and our institutions support the work of the gender equality that is done within you and women in order for us to do this on a global scale, not just nationally. So I would like to mention that. I would also like to say around the political parties, in my opinion, and I was active in politics for 20 years, they just simply need to change the way they work. I mean, political parties, and there is no accident that political parties were designed by men and they are run in the way that men have dominated for a long, long time 
and it needs to change. Otherwise, the political parties will not be intact with our societies. It is just simply unacceptable. I mean, we can say, and I'm not going to go into that, we, I could go into a heated discussion around quotas. All data, for example, from UN Women that had, has loads of dates on this, would show that the general good for the greater population of the world would sit with quotas. Results get more often like that. And then in the end, just final note to ourselves, all the women in this room are political leaders. And I would advise, and this is me saying it because I left politics and I still feel guilty about the fact that I never told it exactly how it is. I never told the women in my party or the women in my country that it was super difficult and way harder for me to be active in politics than my man friends. I didn't say it because it didn't work within the political society that I lived in. I knew that it would affect the outcome of me sort of running if I did it. So I didn't dare to do it until I left. And I would urge all of us to tell women the way it is so they don't feel super strange in a room filled with room and they don't feel that it's them to be blamed. It's more around the gender and we urgently need to tell the women the way it is because women are fighters. They will not shy away from politics because it's hard, but they need to know that it can be hard and they can survive with group of, like this of, of sisters supporting them and with them knowing that it takes like an extra courage to be able to survive. Thank so you thanks. very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank our esteemed guests and hand over the floor and invite all of us to find each other on social media and support us, ourselves across the continents because some of us are going to be heavily campaigning in the next 12 months for some of us in European elections, for some of you in others. And this is the beauty of the network. So let's make use of it, not just in this room, but also in the months ahead. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you very much for the panel discussion on representation. Thank you very much to our panelists. And of course, as this conversation is ending, please allow me to bring to the podium the EU Commissioner for Equality as she shares her keynote speech. Please welcome Helena Daly. Good morning. Um, now, you have another person here coming from an even smaller island in, this, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, I will start by giving my unsolicited opinion <laughs> on the topic of um, quotas or mechanisms to have more women in parliament. We only have to look at the science of it. If you look histor historically at the countries which at some point in their history introduced quotas, you know that now they have a good representation of women in their parliaments. So, I mean, this is not an opinion. This is fact. I like to call quotas an, an unnecessary evil. Nobody likes quotas, but uh, we have learned that they are necessary. And we have learned from countries like Rwanda, for instance, who have a very good representation of women in, in parliament and who had uh, uh, these, as we hear, had here, this mechanism to have more women in decision-making positions. So as much as we hate them, if we don't want to wait another 100 years to have a good representation uh, in our parliament, a good representation of, of women in our parliament, uh, I think, and I speak also for, for my experience as, as Minister for uh, Equality and having introduced this kind of mechanism in, in, in my uh, country, um, I, I must say that as far as, as we have gone today, as, as our experiences, as the data shows us, this is the way to go. If we can find a, a better system, of course, let's discuss it. But up to now, this is the system which has worked 
for many countries all over the world. So thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today at this landmark 10th edition of the Women Political Leaders Summit. For 10 years now, you have gathered some of the most inspirational uh, women leaders for summits in every region of the world. This is fitting because the issues we are discussing are not just encountered by women in politics here in Europe, but around the world. The representation of women in politics is paramount to safeguard European democracy and fundamental rights. These values are the foundations of the European Union and they must be nurtured and protected. Next year, as EU citizens elect a new European Parliament, we have an opportunity to step, take a step forward in terms of representation and in reaffirming our values. In Belgium too, 2024 will be a year of elections at the federal, regional, local and European level. Since your first summit 10 years ago, women have made progress. Belgium is one of only five EU countries that has reached gender parity at the level of senior ministers in the federal government. With 42% of women, Belgium is among the top five EU countries when it comes to gender balance in national parliaments. And both the Belgian House of Representatives and the Senate are now led by women. But across our, unions, our union, it is clear we have much more to do. Only around one third of members of national parliaments across the EU are women. Only a handful of member states have reached gender balance in national parliaments. And only 21% of leaders of major political parties are women. Next year's elections are an opportunity to reshape this landscape. It is not just an issue of fair representation, but it, all, it is also a matter of good governance and better policy making. In other words, the health of our democ democracy is at stake. As with all progress that has been hard won by women over decades, this requires action. For, for instance, we are supporting member states that lag behind in representation of women in politics through awareness raising, political dialogue, and exchange of good practice. Belgium's example with quotas and zipped lists is one that can be followed across the EU and beyond. In the run-up to the elections, I will continue to work with member states to ensure they can learn from each other on what has worked well. We have also funded numerous projects to foster gender equality in political decision-making to help ensure the change we want to see comes from the ground up. For instance, in this very city, the Brussels Binder Beyond project has created a free online database of female policy professionals and journalists, ensuring more women are heard in policy debates across Europe. We highlighted this project and other success stories in our campaign against gender stereotypes, launched in March. Beyond actions on representation, we need to defend European values in the digital age. Our politics is increasingly played out online and the upcoming election campaign will, of course, be no different. This shift has brought to light a level of misogyny that has long driven too many women away from politics. A study by the Interparliamentary Union and the Council of Europe reveals that 85% of the interviewed women parliamentarians experience psychological violence, such as online misogyny. Almost half of the respondents reported having received death threats or threats of rape and beatings. So common are these attacks now that online abuse of women in politics sometimes is misunderstood as inevitable. But we cannot succumb to this idea, just as we would not succumb to any other attack on our European values. I want Europe to lead by example here, and we have already taken steps. Our proposal for a directive to prevent and combat gender-based violence presented last year tackles both on and offline violence against women. 
The proposal includes a strong focus on gender-based cyber violence, filling gaps left by existing gender-neutral legislation in many member states. The proposal covers the criminalization of common forms of gender-based violence, such as the non-consensual sharing of intimate material, cyber stalking, cyber harassment, cyber incitement to hatred or violence based on sex or gender. It will also ensure that illegal gender-based online contact, content can be removed quickly, reinforcing the Digital Services Act in this respect. The proposal includes awareness raising and measures to increase media literacy to help eliminate gender-based online violence from the root. Similarly, we need to tackle the disinformation networks that spread misogynistic attacks. Online platforms have a key role to play and we need to strengthen transparency and accountability. That's why we published guidance on how platforms and other relevant players should strengthen the code of practice on disinformation. And we will facilitate a de dedicated code of conduct to be agreed by online platforms to tackle cyber violence against women. In every corner of the EU, we must ensure young women aspiring to lead can equally and safely participate in political life. I will be at the Justice and Home Affairs Council tomorrow conveying this message to member states. The sexist attacks on women in politics, which, which women face in politics, are not just about outdated attitudes and everyday misogyny. For some, it is a deliberate political strategy. This is un-European and we must not stand for it. When women are not equally represent represented in positions of power, the democratic defici deficit it creates harms us all. So after the next European elections, we want to see women leading equally in our parliaments. And beyond that, we must continue our work to ensure women in political life can speak freely and without fear, online and offline. Only then, will we truly achieve a union of equality and a world of equality? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helena Daly, EU Commissioner for Equality. Madam Daly raises very important questions, very important elements as far as violence against women in politics is concerned. Clearly, it is not somebody else's problem. Clearly, it is our problem. Allow me to bring to the podium the moderator for our next panel discussion, Terry Schultz, who's a freelance correspondent, NPR, and Deutsche Welle. And Terry will coordinate this conversation amongst Mabel Memory Chinomona, President of the Senate of Zimbabwe, President of the African Parliamentary Union, APU, and WPL Country Ambassador. Also, we will have Carlian Scheel, Director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Also, Member of the European Parliament in the person of Lucia Duris Nikolsonova. Also joining this panel is Maria Pendes, Minister of Defense of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 2015 to 2019. Last, definitely not the least on this panel, is Senator, Senate of Cameroon, Elizabeth Regina Mundi. Please welcome our ladies. politicians, this probably doesn't feel strange, but for me it does. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Welcome to our panel. I'm Terry Schultz. 
I'm a journalist uh, who's been covering Brussels for 15 years, other countries before that, um, many war zones under my belt. Uh, I know a thing or two about violence against women, violence against women politicians, violence against women activists, and I just have to say I'm so flattered and proud to be hosting this panel of brave women here. You, you've heard their names uh, announced as we came in. Um, I will uh, introduce them briefly once again uh, as they speak. And they have agreed to share personal stories about their careers, uh, the violence, the abuse that they have suffered. And I think that that's so brave. Um, and I just applaud you all even before we start. So the statistics that we have are that 85% of women politicians have experienced online violence and 10% have experienced physical violence. So as we were speaking in the room before we came in here, I thought that sounded really low <laughs> from just anecdotally. So among you here in this room, how many of you have experienced online violence? Raise your hand. Uh, mm, I don't think we're up to 85% there, but maybe it's because some people didn't. Listen, <laughs> no. Um, okay, so um, how many of you have actually been physically assaulted or had physical attacks? Almost as many, almost not quite as many. Okay, but we have a lot of lucky people here because I think we're going to, we're going to hear some stories here today that make it clear that um, this is all too common. Um, so hold on, let me get back to my notes. So, so in, in the United States, <clears throat> Amnesty International found that women were 27 times more likely to experience online abuse via Twitter alone than, other, that, than men. You're nodding your head. I think none of us are surprised by that. And one interesting note is that when I discussed this with my panelists here, um, more than one of them pointed out that the worst remarks they get the worst abuse they get is not from men. It's from women. And that, and everyone's nodding their head. You get worse messages from women. Oh my gosh. Okay, I mean, I also, I mean, share, share, this, <laughs> share many of these stories as somebody who's quite out there on social media. Uh, <laughs> we can't let this happen. Um, obviously, Obviously, there have to be solutions, and we are the ones who are going to have to find them. And that is something we are also going to talk about on this panel, I'm happy to say. So let me get right to the more interesting people. Here, we're going to, to start with, with Mabel. Um, as you heard very briefly in, in the introduction, she's president of the Senate of Zimbabwe. She's also president of the African Parliamentary Union and is WPL's country ambassador for Zimbabwe. So Mabel. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you, you don't moderator. have to do a thing, Mabel, just show up. Thank you, moderator. <laughs> uh, it's quite a pleasure, honestly, to be among you ladies, to have our own time of sharing what happened to you, what has happened to our colleagues in the uh, political, political life. Because to someone who grew up through the ranks, you should have met quite a lot. Uh, for example, to me, I think I will just introduce myself and add that I am an ex-combatant. I fought for, the, uh, for, for my country to be uh, liberated. So <laughs> because of that, I felt I could join in the political arena because I had the right uh, to be there. So I, I started by uh, joining the structures. The, then I came up to be a leader of a regional, chairperson of a regional uh, women's organization. So that time, this is when it started that the president needed someone who would lead in the constituencies and represent the women in one of the constituencies. You know what happened? They say that chairperson of that particular region should come up and uh, because he's an ex-combatant. Uh, the, the chair, the chiefs of that particular district organized themselves and went to the president that in our area 
we cannot be led by a woman. So the, uh, the, pre the, the president of that time just said, she is an ex-combatant. She managed to go to the revolution. She trained and fought. So she has that right. So you know what happens? I have understood that these men use our colleagues, women, because it, it, it's very unfortunate. It is disturbing to note that among the main perpetrators of uh, violence against women are the women themselves, the poor head down syndrome. Because you can, our women, uh, when, by that time, they were not prepared to have someone in front of them. So to, to become a president of the Senate up to now, it's not very easy because I had to now go and stand in front of those people which were led by these chiefs who are, who are being told that we cannot be led by a woman. And the women by that time thought it's not possible. But I had to conscientize them. I had to work flat out so that they understand that women can do it. So I, the next term, in that term I managed to get in. In, in. in the next term, I think I only beg their hearts because I had to go and sleep in the schools, in the classrooms with them so that we have time, so that they like me, they enjoy my being there. I tell them how I represent them. So it's a long time back, but I want to tell you that that one uh, caused my marriage because my husband that time could not take it because you know the messages which were coming into him that she is cho chosen because she has an affair with that person, that leader, the leader of that country, the, the president. Uh, I think uh, five years ago, my son uh, was uh, driving a car, so he picked someone on the way, then he, he started, this other one, passenger, started talking to him, saying, ah, you know these people who are being appointed, like that woman, Mabel, oh, she has some, some, some children with the sitting president now. <laughs> He's telling my son, can you imagine? <laughs> then my son kept on quiet driving on. So my son knew that he was uh, approaching the destination. Then he said, but Mr. Men, which children are these? Then he said, they are, they are, they are two, two guys uh, and a girl. Then he said, do you know that I am her son? You know, he felt bad. And he, after, I think, a kilometer, he just said, can you please drop me here? <laughs> because he felt bad. So this is what is happening. That they, they create stories. They say a lot of things about you. But I think what we need to do now is to conscientize our women. They should understand that this is, this should be, <coughs> this should be talked about that women, our own, the, our own women, who are always on the lines voting for men, but women can do it because every woman has the same problem. Your colleague can face everything because a lot is said. Because you face problems not because you, have, you are the one who caused that problem, but because some people are being used, they can prefer that, you know this friend of yours, okay? This one is the one we, who is better than you. It's then that other woman may think she is better. They want you to fight. So that one, you need to be very careful. Uh, but I'm happy to have this chance of sharing to you what happened to me. It's quite a lot. I cannot say it all, but those are some of the things which can happen to people. Which, which is difficult because politics is always a fight to some extent. You do have to go out and say, I am better than the other person. But it can't be a personal fight like this and it can't be gender based, right? Yes. It's, it's difficult. Okay, I'm go going to move to another politician, Regina Mundi. She's a Cameroonian senator who has also held many positions, climbed up through government, 
rung by rung, difficult? Uh, difficult. Um, Regina, tell us, tell us your story. Yes, my dear sisters, it's really a great pleasure for me to be in this room, which is full of history and filled with power right now. The power to the women, that's what we say in our country. We say power to the women. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here this morning to share with you some of the difficulties that we have in Cameroon as far as violence against women in politics is concerned. We have other forms of violence, especially domestic violence, but unfortunately, women tolerate domestic violence because they say they have to protect their children, which is quite sad. But we are not talking about that today. We are concerned more, I think, about political violence. Political violence in Cameroon takes many, many dimensions. And uh, one of the most common form of, of violence is psychological violence. Women are threatened outrightly. If you dare stand for election for this position, you will see something. And with such threats, women just fall back. And uh, sometimes the violence uh, it does not remain at the verbal stage. It actually moves on to actual practice. Our country had been a one-party de um, one democracy for many years until um, 1985, when our president introduced, or the parliament introduced multi -party, a multi-party system. So in 1992, there was a, the parliamentary elections, uh, presidential ele elections in 1992, and there were several candidates. There were five candidates for president. And in my part of the country, from the Northwest region, I was leading the political campaigns. Of course, I had a lot of threats. I was leading the political campaigns for the president, the one who was the, the, the current president. There were lots of uh, threats. I really did not comprehend that these threats could become reality. On the day the elections were announced, in fact, my whole house was burnt down to ashes. I had six children with me in the house, three of my own and three other children living with me. You can imagine they came back from school that day and not even, everything was gone. When I say everything, I mean everything. All we had left was what we had on us on that day. It was a very traumatizing experience and it has, remained a traumatizing experience for some of those children. When they see a crowd of people together, they just, be, you know, they, they react negatively. That was where I decided that, no, I have lost everything. Why should I now leave politics? I should just <laughs> remain there. Where was I to go to? Now, that action alone deterred so many women from coming on board. Many women who could have otherwise have come on board to become political leaders. And they said, no, if being in politics is to have my house burnt down, I, I, I better stay away from it. You know. And this had a, I was not the only woman who was affected, but I was the one badly affected because I was the leader of the political campaign in that region at that time. Many other women lost their properties too and uh, they were harassed in so many ways. Even some churches turned against them. It was a very difficult period. And uh, this kind of attitude that we have towards women in politics is affecting very much so the number of women who want to come on board, especially the women who are qualified who could come on board because they are afraid. Some of them don't have the stamina. And for some of them, their husbands would not let them go. Say, no, no. I cannot afford to lose my property, so you better keep out of politics. Insults, of course, it's uh, what you want to show. You want to show that you are one. Even women will say, you know, you want to, what do you want to show? That you are better off than anyone else. And uh, this kind of uh, situation, I don't know where it, it came from because this kind of attitude has been displayed by other women who joined the men 
to fight the women. But then, when I was growing up, when our country was struggling to become independent, women did a lot to gain independence, to bring about this independent movement to reality. Women worked together, together. So at, at, at this particular moment, you now found women working against women. It is a phenomenon that is very, very unreal. And uh, as I remained in the party, moving up in politics until I became a senator, well, other things too happened. Our country, uh, we have the English-speaking part of Cameroon and uh, the French-speaking part. I come from the English-speaking part. But we are working now very hard to, to, to have a country that everyone will become bilingual so that the, the next generation of people in our country will all be bilingual because we are working towards a strong, united Cameroon. But we have had a group of people come up from the, the, the English-speaking part who want to separate the country and uh, make it uh, um, uh, a separate uh, um, region or a separate country. This has been a very disturbing issue for us because the number of uh, um, kidnappings and killings and rapes on women, it is really, really terrible. I myself sitting here, I was kidnapped and I was with the separatists in the bushes for one whole month. But how I came out without any physical harm is a mystery. But many people were praying for me, and God heard those prayers. But it is by God's grace that I'm here today. But the, the, the issue is... Thank you very much, Regina. We have we need to get through um, everyone's stories, and we will have time to come back for for a second round. But that was, those were pretty remarkable stories. Can I just ask, was was anybody found guilty for burning your house down? So were the, was there also a story where somebody was held responsible, so women could have some faith in that? It was mob action. So the nobody who, 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 whose party did not win moved in and did this. Well, some people were arrested and so on. Well, really, I was so disturbed. I, I never followed up to know whether they were punished or not. Huh. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible story. Okay, we are going to, um, now I hate to cut people off. I could sit and listen to each one of my speakers for, for hours, but unfortunately we have only 45 minutes. So now, Lucia, you're going to uh, also, we're going to move back to Europe where these certainly aren't um, isolated instances in, in, on the African continent. Um, we also have um, situations here. Uh, Lucia was a journalist before, so she's, um, she's, she knows abuse from many different directions. Um, tell, tell, us, tell us your story and also how you're working now in the European Parliament to try to at least establish a legal basis for stopping these kind of crimes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, in 2016, we had uh, parliamentary elections and I ended up uh, as the most successful woman among uh, Slovak politicians. And uh, of course, this calls that uh, I all of a sudden had a lot of enemies because, uh, you know, it was uh, quite a surprise that a women politician is not just an oleander standing there with an ice purse and smiling, but uh, it could be someone fighting uh, corrupt, other corrupt politicians, etc. And these were my very strong topics that I covered at the time anti-corruption because uh, Slovakia back then was quite a corrupt um, country, I have to say, with a quite a corrupt uh, government. And this basically led to uh, assassination of uh, investigative journalist. It's a very well-known story. His name was Jan Kuciak. Anyway. And his uh, girlfriend. And his girlfriend. Because I was uh, so successful at the parliamentary election, uh, they elected me to be a vice president uh, of the Slovak national parliament, uh, representing the opposition. And uh, this guy, who was at that time the president of the, of the Slovak national parliament, he hated me. He hated me so much. And uh, <laughs> he would hum humiliate me in front of other colleagues, calling me ugly gypsy. Because uh, together with um, my very strong anti-corruption uh, policy and topics, I also covered uh, the rights for marginalized Roma communities that are in Slovakia. 
And uh, so he called me uh, on TV, this little gypsy will never jump on me, etc., etc. And uh, he really thought I was very ugly and he remembered me about being ugly uh, all the time, behind closed doors, uh, but also, you know, uh, among uh, uh, other politicians, etc. And uh, I was pregnant and um, he told me before I gave birth to my third child that uh, if you don't come back immediately from the hospital and you don't lead the parliamentary sessions, I will get rid of you. You know, you will, you will lose your position. So after five days of Caesarean section, I was sitting in the parliament and leading the, the parliamentary session because I talked I told to myself that you, you will be the last person on this earth who would get rid of me. <laughs> I've had two of those. I don't know how you do it. Yes, thank you. Uh, but, uh, you know, at, at that time, I really wanted to show to the women that we are capable of doing this. You know, we are. We are much stronger than the men think. And so this was my message to the women. And for my surprise, you know, it was women who sent me a lot of threats at that time and a lot of hate speech. Because they, they said that you only think about your career and you don't think about, you know, your child. And you should be at home, you know, cooking for your husband and breastfeeding your child, which I was, I was, you know. But uh, so uh, if we are talking like who's giving us a really bad time, it's it's quite often the women and not the men, uh, right, treating us as wrong. And we, don't, we just don't stick together. And then, then um, there was also a very strong campaign against me, a former uh, agent of Secret Service. They were digging very deep to find something to discredit me, and they didn't find anything. So they falsified documents of Canadian police that basically through my stay in Canada, I was a prostitute. <laughs> so, and uh, they published these false documents online and it was like a storm, you know? I couldn't walk with, uh, with my three children on the street because the people were spitting on me that I am a whore, you know, from Canada, etc., etc. And, you know, Slovakia is a post-communist uh, country in the east of, of uh, Europe. You can imagine how, yeah, how many Slovaks have this hate towards US and Canada and all these West countries. So it was so difficult for me to, to beat this, even though the ca Canadian government, uh, you know, uh, proved that it was falsified. Uh, it wasn't true, nothing was true in these documents. Until very recent days, you know, people remind me that you, you go back to Canada and because you are a prostitute, nothing, nothing better than this. And when I pressed charges, the police just got rid of it. And I have a quote here why they got rid of it. From the point of view of the average reasonable individual, the information is not capable of causing substantial prejudice to the person concerned, which is not true because until the very recent days, I've been fighting with this public opinion about me and trying to prove that this was falsified and I'm really not a prostitute from Canada, which is, I mean, so difficult. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Nothing, well, yeah, it was just not true. So, so I think this is very serious, you know, the disinformation that are spreading around uh, on the social media and very often the target of this disinformation campaigns are women women that are vivid in public, that are seen. You know, it's not only the politicians, it's also the journalists, etc., etc. And last thing I'd like to say, it's not only about me, right? Now we have Madam President, Madam Zuzana Chaputova. I mean, Google her out. She is an angel, you know? <laughs> she is such a strong woman and she faces a lot of hate speech. And just recently, we, uh, there was this public session organized by a very corrupted uh, party in, in Slovakia called SMER. They're a part of social democrats in the European Parliament. And there was this huge crowd and these politicians from this party, they were uh, calling our Madam President an American slut. And this, and this crowd, you know, they shouted, she's an American slut, she's an American slut. And behind 
these men, politicians. There was a Slovak politician, MEP, you know, uh, from the, the European Parliament, standing like this, smiling and not saying anything to protect another woman, our Madam President. So this is the real picture from a country, you know, uh, that basically is a member of uh, European Union. It's such a sad so story. Oh, yeah. Now next door in, in the Czech Republic, though, she has a huge feminist, Petr Pavel, uh, a yeah. former NATO general, uh, elected yeah. to president, and I dare them to say that to her in front of him oh, because yes. they're buddies. Definitely, so, very, very good buddies. Yeah, yeah. no, this, yeah. Is, this is going to change things. No, she I really also, think Pavel's going to change things. She also has very, very uh, good buddies in Slovakia, yeah, believe good. me. Yeah, we fight for her very, very uh, much. This is incredible. Um, okay, so, the stories continue here. <laughs> Pro-NATO? If you're pro-NATO, you, you get that. Okay, so I think that um, everyone remembers Bosnia-Herzegovina and the violence against women there. This is where we really saw uh, rape used as a weapon. It was thanks to Bosnia that um, European courts often started recognizing rape as a... Yeah. Uh, oh, um, and Marina Pendish, our next speaker, comes from this background, and she has been Minister of Defense, and uh, so I, I would imagine that rising up through those ranks with that history, and as we were speaking before, so many of these women um, have yet to see justice. The wheels are turning so slowly in Bosnia. Um, Marina, please share with us what, what you ex have experienced. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm so glad to spend time with all of you a great woman from the world in this positive and creative uh, spirit. And I think uh, all of us can do it, something in the future in this area, political area for protecting a woman. I uh, have, like a woman, sometimes a problem, not in parliament, not in government, I, I start with that. But uh, during uh, my uh, career in the beginning, I have some kind of attacks on me from the major of uh, Yugoslavia uh, People's Army. We have some invent and he put uh, his uh, hand on my legs and I ask him, please uh, take off your hand. He don't want and uh, in those times we smoking in the area and I put a cigarette on his head. <laughs> from those times I never have any attacks. <laughs> And that was very hard in ex Yugoslavia, that is socialism was, and major of uh, Yena was a very important person. After that, after the war, and or during the war in our country, many women was some kind of we weapons from different part of uh, three army in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina during the war, and till now, many of them don't have satisfied with some prosecution a prosecution of, of uh, perpetrators uh, during the war, and I hope uh, our uh, system, uh, political system, finds solution or uh, have faster process. Or, or uh, we have a problem because we adapted our strategy for organized and uh, crime during the war, but uh, we, hold, we have so many processes in our country and still we waiting on, on final solution. And I hope we, we will want like a woman in those. Uh, I, I, I will focus on, on some activities in, especially in Ministry of Defense for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, because we uh, adopted some kind of strategy, uh, prevention violence against the woman in zone of conflict. And we have very good uh, peacekeeping operation training center. They be training um, many uh, policemen, soldiers, not just from Bosnia and Herzegovina, then from the world, from Ukraine, fr from uh, Colombia, to recognize uh, if are they in some UN or uh, some NATO lead operation, they must recognize where is the problem in the field when we uh, want to stop the violence 
uh, especially sexual violence against women. And I think we in Bosnia and Herzegovina have a big experience and we can ex uh, exchange that on the shelf, that, but not now. But we can exchange our uh, emails and uh, have a contact, especially some uh, uh, states or your representatives from the country, they have some kind of war, especially war against the against the woman in, in your country. I think uh, in political life, in uh, parliamentary life, uh, we, like a woman they have enough experience, don't have any problem now. But in the beginning, young ladies have a problem, especially with social media. Why? Because they don't have opportunity to be in public media, on television, on uh, radio, to present themselves, to present their program, and they use social media. In social media, you can uh, block everybody who hate you, like uh, we already have opportunity to hurt. Uh, and I think it's very important to have enough support from your political party for young ladies, not just for ladies, for young women, then for young men. They have opportunity to present their programs. Uh, I think that uh, women don't uh, have enough uh, uh, space in media. Uh, many fake news about uh, especially young women is in, uh, uh, in, the, in the social media. Hate speech is something like a weapon, uh, especially against the woman. And I, uh, the, the, maybe the recipe in Bosnia and Herzegovina especially, is uh, much more consequences through the law. And even though we adopted our action plan based on the resolution, uh, UN Resolution 1325, we already have some problem, not on the state level or federal level, but the lowest on the municipality <coughs> level. And I think uh, my message is for any woman in the world, don't afraid dare to change the world, take action, and yesterday we have a good sense. Take your space, a woman. Fulfill your space. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Well, our, our final speaker, and we will come again for another round for some solutions that each of my panelists have worked on that they have found effective, but now Carlene Schiele from uh, the European Institute for Gender Equality. Uh, none of these stories will surprise you because your job is to research, uh, research these kind of issues and try to use data to come up with, with solutions. Um, so, Carlene, if you could um, share with us what, what we know, what, what you have learned about violence against women. I mean, I think some of these stories are shocking. The numbers are shocking. Um, share, with, share your data with us, please. Yes, thank you so much. And good morning to you all. First of all, I would like to thank WPL for inviting me and to explain briefly what my institute does. So we are the European Knowledge Centre on Gender Equality, one of the agencies of the European Commission. And we collect data and information on gender <coughs> equality in the European Union at EU level and country level. And when I'm listening to these stories, I immediately realise that a message that I send to my own staff, but also to the external world, is it's of course very important to collect data and information, but let's never forget that behind those data and information there are stories of real people. And I think also the testimonies that we are hearing again in this panel show data are important, information is important, quantitative information is important because we provide our information to policymakers, to politicians, but behind this are the stories of women, girls, and also men and boys. And it's not about the other people. No, it's about us. It's about all of us. We experience this on a daily basis. So let me share um, some of our findings with you. First of all, it's women who are disproportionately facing violence. We look at the European Union, but we also know that outside the European Union, this is the fact, and the majority of perpetrators are men. It doesn't mean, I think that's sometimes a misunderstanding, 
that the perpetrators couldn't be women. We, we, I've listened to you, eh? and you also have been facing this, this, let's say, this violence by women. But the majority of perpetrators are men. That's what our studies show. Men all over the place, through all the social classes. Education doesn't matter. It's men committing violence against women. And, you know, we are talking about the violation of a human right of women, but let me also mention here an economic figure. Because you know what this violence against, and against women and girls costs the European Union on a yearly basis? The figure is shocking. And I really don't understand why it doesn't wake up politicians. 366 billion euros on a yearly basis. That's the cost, the estimation, our estimation of the cost, economic costs of violence against women and girls in the European Union. 366 billion euros. And of course, for me, that's not the most important factor because it's about violation of human rights, but it's an amazing amount. Let me share the... What do you mean the cost? The cost, the how, costs, do you, how is that tabulated? All the, it includes all the costs. So the medical costs, uh, children witnessing the violence, we have included everything, 366 billion euros on a yearly basis. And you know, knowing that the European Union is trying, trying to get out of a financial crisis and the Commission provides all these beautiful instruments for member states, eh? national action plans, in almost none of these plans you see any attention for gender equality, mm -hmm. let alone for gender-based violence. Um, let me share with you a few other findings. Um, our evidence has shown that there is a continuum between the offline and the online world, and vice versa. So many of the, let's say, perpetrators of online violence are also the ones who commit violence offline. What we also see is that Twitter has become the number one place for this cyber violence, and maybe contrary to the violence offline, it, it looks as if there's no boundaries for online violence. Many of the perpetrators think they're anonymous. And let me share an example that I heard in my own country, Netherlands, last week, of a public person who was facing so much online violence, and he found out who this perpetrator was, and he contacted the man. It was a he and a he, a male victim, a male perpetrator. And he said, listen, you're consistently harassing me. Why? Can I ask you why? And then that guy said, oh, I'm very sorry. I didn't think about it. And I think that's also what evidence shows. There seems to be no boundaries. So someone is upset, angry about something, and they just start typing. And they don't think about the consequences of their messages at all. Um, so Twitter has become the number one place for this uh, cyber violence. I also see that um, we, some reports have seen the light eh, on cyber violence uh, for women politicians. The Council of Europe published a report two years ago, also at global level. There was an interesting report in 2020 from the Interparliamentary Union. And why do these figures shock us so much? Many of the respondents said, but it's politicians, no? They, they do this job to make the world better. So how come that in their own parli parliaments, there's so much violence going on. And it's a misunderstanding that women are safe in their homes. No, the majority of victims are victims of domestic violence. There's no safe places for women on this world, unfortunately. And parliaments are no exception. Um, so what we see from research as well, and you see it also in your daily business without any doubt, women no longer want to take up political positions, no. They don't want to be bullied on a daily basis. So they give up on choosing political functions. And we are massively losing talent in this world because there are so, our research shows there are so many talented women in the European Union. And we are losing this talent. I know that in the second round we're going to speak about solutions. I have a few <laughs> solutions that we found through our research, but maybe I do it in the second round. Maybe one word, one last word, because anti-gender movements has been mentioned today. It was mentioned yesterday. 
our research shows the more vocal we become, the more visible we become, the more violent these movements become. And you know they're very well organized, very well financed, and what my institute is currently working on is the right narratives. It was mentioned yesterday, how should we speak? What should we say? So we're collecting good practices that have worked in practice, and we will publish them, we will make them available, and I also hope it will help you in your daily work. Thank you. So, <clears throat> as many of you have seen from, from the original schedule, it is so far behind, but I don't want to contribute too much. I know the next speakers are here. Um, so let's just go through the panel um, and perhaps give your top two solutions. What do you think are the top two things we need to do? I don't know, two or three. But uh, we, need to, we need to make this, unfortunately, quite quick. Uh, I, I had uh, prepared something uh, th uh, that we, we think can help. The African Union has laid out strategies and initiatives that promote gender equality through its gender strategy of 2018. We consider women's movements and civil society organizations as key in ending violence against women. The SADC sub-region to which Zimbabwe is a member has put in place the regional GBV strategy, which provides a framework for national governments to put an end to violence against women. Zimbabwe, in its effort to end violence against women in politics, has been inclusive and part participatory, involving stakeholders who include the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, and the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, and the Zimbabwe Republic Police, among others. The Zimbabwe Women Parliamentary Caucus has been equally active, and we are encouraging that every country should have a caucus, that women, when they are in parliament, they should support each other. When, when someone is debating, all the women should support, not to go against it, because at the end of the day, this one won't come up again. She will be shy and won't be, or won't be free to debate. So this caucus uh, will not uh, maybe segregate that this one is from the opposition or the ruling party. The women should be in that particular caucus so that they, they sit down and agree and support each other. Uh, be it an opposition or a ruling party, they will be supporting whatever the women are debating in parliament. I think on that one, who end up uh, with achieving that the women should be stronger. Thank you. Thank you. And even if they don't agree, to support each other even when they disagree, nobody's going to have the same opinions, yes. but, but you have to empower each other to have your own opinions, exactly. right? That sounds really, really practical. Thank you. Lucia. Okay, uh, I think um, it's very important to set a framework uh, so that the perpetrators in the online sector and online world uh, can be punished. Like for instance, I, I pressed so many charges for online threats that I uh, have received through the years and only in one case the police did their job and the man was caught and he got a fine of 16 euros, right? And, uh, and these were like serious threats. I even had to have uh, a, um, uh, official protection, like bodyguards sent from the Office of General Prosecutor. So you can see that uh, the police uh, quite often doesn't care or they claim they, that uh, they don't have a decent framework uh, in terms of legislation. So I'm very glad that right now I'm working on a directive uh, of combating violence against women and domestic violence. And we also name uh, the cyber violence against women in this directive. And so I hope that this will be successful, even though I have no idea how we will go through the trialogues with the council, because of course the member states don't like this directive, because this is something that they would have to follow, right? Um, yeah, so we will see. But you know, I mean, to be honest, one thing, thing is legislation. You can put strong and nice words on a piece of paper, but the main goal is to change the setup 
uh, the, of the minds of people, you know, and this is the real job. We need to cultivate our society and uh, we need uh, to give them examples, not only of the women politicians who are being threatened and, and who are facing the violence because uh, this will cause the real trouble that the, the women will not be able or they will not want to enter the politics and this is this is very bad picture of our future if we allowed this happen so we need examples of the perpetrators that were punished you know for causing violence against women and it doesn't matter whether politicians or journalists or or public uh, figures, right, uh, women. So we really need this and we need to cultivate our societies. We need to, we need to educate our kids. I mean, forget about the older generation, you know, the stereotypes towards women are so strong in their mindsets that uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, basically we cannot work with it too much, but we can work with the young generation. We have to enter the schools and the, and the educational system and, and, and prove to the kids that there is no difference between a girl or a boy. There is nothing that the, the girl is not able to do compared to a boy. So I think this is the long-term run, but we have to start. Definitely. Thank you. Regina. Yes, uh, my proposal is quite simple. You see, when you have a dirty house and you realize that your house is dirty, you start sweeping your house before you look for help. So women have a problem. Women have got to stand together, irrespective of their political parties, irrespective of their political views. When it comes to woman, woman, we should become one. That is the main thing that I see, standing together, protecting each other. That is all. If we do that, we are going to succeed. And the women should not die in silence. If there is any violence, any act of violence against a woman, cry out and you will have help. Thank you. Thank you. And this summit, obviously, and the efforts of WPL are one way to do this that, of course, didn't exist before. I think everything starts in the family or, or from the family. Preventing violence in the family, we preventing violence against women little girl or boys and put that in the law, increase a punishment, financial punishment, not 15 euros, then 1,000 or 15,000 euros. That is some kind of solution and I completely agree, networking, women networking and training for a woman to don't afraid against perpetrators, fight you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my top three, <clears throat> the focus on youth, it was already mentioned. Uh, my institute launched a campaign last year, Three Steps Forward, and we invite important uh, stakeholders to, to mention their three steps forward and how they would like to contribute to gender equality. And we invited Vice President Timmermans, and he said something very nice. He said, you know, we need to raise our children for equality. We need to raise our children for gender equality. We need to empower our daughters to dream big and bold. It was also said yesterday. And we also need to teach our sons that they, they shouldn't be tough, but we, teach, we need to teach them to care and express their emotions. So the youth, the, the young people copy what they see. They see politicians bad-mouthing each other, cursing at each other, sometimes when they put on television. So we need to teach them. Secondly, we know from our research that role models, and maybe it sounds a bit outdated, but it's still very important, they are important. Role models are very important. So as you said, and as was said yesterday, women need to keep um, taking their space and visible. And the third one, legislation, is of utmost importance at EU level, at national level. Um, the Istanbul Convention was already mentioned. I would like to mention another initiative of Commission Helena Dali, 
she said we need to extend the list of EU crimes to hate speech and hate crime. Yeah, very important. So my top three will be these. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. I think we have some very practical solutions, not easy to accomplish, but uh, this is where we start. Thank you all for being here, and thank you so much to my brave and articulate panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much to Terry Schultz. Ladies, we have a very important element coming up equally important as the past few panels and I'm going to ask you very respectfully to take your seats. May I kindly have my ushers bringing in our, our participants from outside. Thank you. Can we have all our participants back in the room please? We have a very important session that is coming up. And if I can kindly ask all the ushers to help to bring in all our participants from the hallways, from the coffee rooms, back into the session. I would be very grateful. One, two. Can we please have all our participants coming back into the room for our next session? Thank you. And now ladies, can you give yourselves a round of applause? Can you give me the energy? Can you give me the positive energy? I love your, your dance. And for our panelists who have shared stories that under normal circumstances they couldn't share, please a round of applause for them. Thank you very much WPEL for giving us a safe space and that is what this space is. It is a safe space, but it's also a space that must encourage your courage, so to speak. When you leave here, we from WPL want to encourage you to use social media positively, tell that story, and share our hashtag WPL Summit 2023. And that way, more of our participants who are at home, and when I say participants, the women whose voices need to be heard can be reached. And now, ladies, I'm going to ask you to turn your eyes to the screen right behind me. A very important film. Be a lady, they said. Take a look. Your skirt is too short. Your shirt is too low. Don't show so much skin. Cover up. Leave something to the imagination. Don't be a temptress. Men can't control themselves. Men have needs. Look sexy. Look hot. Don't be so provocative. You're asking for it. Wear black. Wear heels. You're too dressed up. You're too dressed down. You look like you've let yourself go. Be a lady, they said. Don't be too fat. Don't be too thin. Eat up. Slim down. Stop eating so much. Order a salad. Don't eat carbs. Skip dessert. Go on a diet. God, you look like a skeleton. Why don't you just eat? You look emaciated, you look sick. Men like women with some meat on their bones. Be a size zero, be a double zero, be nothing. Be less than nothing. Be a lady, they said. Remove your body hair. Bleach this, bleach that. Eradicate your scars. Cover your stretch marks, plump your lips. Botox your wrinkles, lift your face, tuck your tummy, perk up your boobs. Look natural. You're trying too hard. You look overdone. Men don't like girls who try too hard. Be a lady, they said. Wear makeup. Highlight your cheekbones. Line your lids. Fill in your brows. Lengthen your lashes. Color your lips. Powder, blush, bronze, highlight. Your hair is too short. 
dye your hair, not blue. That looks unnatural. Look young, old is ugly. Men don't like love. Be a lady, they say. Save yourself, be pure. Don't be a whore, don't sleep around. Men don't like sluts. Don't be a prude, don't be so uptight. And smile more, pleasure men. Be experienced, be sexual, be innocent, be dirty. Be the cool girl, don't be like the other girls. Be a lady, they said, don't talk too loud. Don't talk too much. Don't be intimidating. Why are you so miserable? Don't be a bitch. Don't be so bossy. Don't be so emotional. Don't cry. Don't yell. Don't swear. Endure the pain. Don't complain. Fold his clothes. Cook his dinner. Keep him happy. That's a woman's job. You'll make a good wife someday. Take his last name. You hyphenated your name. Crazy feminist. Give him children. You don't want children? You will someday. He'll change your mind. Be a lady, they say. Don't get raped. Don't drink too much. Don't walk alone. Don't go out too late. Don't dress like that. Don't get drunk. Don't smile at strangers. Don't go out at night. Don't trust anyone. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Just be a lady. I'm not sure what kind of ladies you are. Now I don't know if I want to be a lady after all. But there's power in being a lady. Please do welcome a wonderful lady to the podium. Allow Madame Stephanie Dos, the president of the Senate of Belgium, to share a few words. After watching this video, you may feel uh, a bit dizzy, a bit nauseous, maybe a bit shocked. Why is that? Well, this video is saying the quiet parts out loud. Here it is, the elephant in the room, displayed on a big screen, nowhere to hide. Every word hitting like a punch. Not because we are surprised of what we hear, we hear these words all of our lives. They may seem innocent individually, but added up together, they reveal the paradox. They reveal the permanent pressure that has been shaping women and the way that women seen themselves or seen by men and by society for centuries. And sadly, Sadly, sisters, very often, they also shape the way on, on how we see ourselves. Whether we come from the capital of Europe or from a small village in India, we experience the same. Relatives, friends, colleagues, even strangers, all of them thinking they need to tell us what to do. All those words and impressions which we read and see every day without filters in magazines, commercials, movies, on TV, on social media. And so, sisters, we carry a very, very big responsibility for passing on these stereotypes, generation after generation, sometimes even without realizing it. Even if we define ourselves as feminists, even as empowered women, as we are, even as leaders. What is it about? It is about the impossible standards forced on women, forced on us. It is about the mental charge of being all those contradicting things at once. It is about the fact that no matter what we do, to some people, we will always be wrong. The goals and the expectations that we have been set for women are not attainable, are unrealistic, and above all, they are totally unfair and discriminating. And of course, the media too, they carry a responsibility by repeating again and again the same old cliches about women. The women objects, the temptress, the flawless woman combining career and family on high stilettos the happy caring housewife with a freshly baked cake for husband and children. You know, even I sometimes have to fight myself. 
not to fall into cliches. This morning, I was standing in front of my closet, wondering what to wear. You all know the feeling. And my hand pointed out to a suit, because we all wear a suit to feel empowered, to act and dress like a man. But I decided today to do otherwise. I put on a dress today, a short, summery dress. It is 25 degrees after all, with a décolleté. Because I am proud to be a woman, and so I dress like a woman. It is one small way to fight the stereotype, to fight the unfair expectations. And when I was writing this speech, I remember an incident when I was in my 20s. I worked as an advisor for a senior member of government. And one day I had to replace her as a speaker at a very important and high level event. Back then, I put on a nice black suit and a white shirt to look professional. I was nervous, of course, but I looked forward to it. And when I arrived, the organizers, they spotted me, they walked up to me and they said, you must be from the catering. Ladies, the lesson is never try to fit in. Dress the way you want, act the way you want, just be who you are. And you see, And you see, it works. Women are becoming more and more comfortable on being her. But, of course, there is always a but. There are still so many fights to be fought. Stereotypes are, for example, massively used to sell any product, from dishwashers to toothpaste to chocolate bars. It seems that women have that power, or at least their bodies do, to make any ordinary object to look hot, to look sexy. Almost 50% of women, 50% are sexualized in commercials as opposed to only 2% of men. Should we do something to address it? Should we legislate on the way women are portrayed in all forms of media? I throw the ball to you. Can we do more? Is it enough? Is it enough that we support media, media initiatives that promote gender equality and political coverage? Can we hope that the media will highlight our policies and achievements rather than comment on our appearances, on our personal lives? Whether we have nice hair or style, of course we all have. Why don't you have children? Implying that maybe it is because we are too ambitious? Who our partner is? And how does it feel for him to be the man in the shadow? Do we also need to legislate on other forms of female representation? Should we introduce more conditions of inclusion in government funding of media? Sisters, are we doing enough? Are we ready as a society to achieve full equality? I honestly don't know the answer to these questions. Is there a right answer? What I do know is the fact that we are politicians. Our strength lies in our actions. So maybe, maybe is the time for hashtag me too in politics. I have been point thank you. <laughs> I have been pointing out a problem for a very long time. Where there is a power, there is abuse of power. And that abuse often has a gender dimension, from certain remarks to downward vulgar talks to inappropriate sexual conducts. Women are belittled, their self-esteem eroded, and their dignity is totally denied. I joined politics in uh, my early 20s, already 20 years ago, out of conviction because I wanted change, I wanted to contribute, I wanted to have a positive impact. And I don't think it will surprise you, any one of you, that a young woman in politics has to endure a lot. Well, 
girls. It is those stories that I do not want to hear anymore. I no longer want to hear that the young woman's ideas are being ignored in a conference room until a man says exactly the same thing and everybody applauds him. I have experienced that. I no longer want to hear a young MP get sexual comments when she gives a male colleague a simple compliment. I wish I hadn't experienced it. I can handle it right now. But it scares away young, talented girls. To save the future generations of politics, we, we all of us, we need to stand up. It is our duty as politicians to set a higher example for others to follow. It is our duty as women political leaders to speak out against sexist remarks, to speak out against horrible behaviors in politics. We cannot, we cannot remain silent when we hear inappropriate jokes or comments, when they undress us with their eyes, or when we receive remarks about our cleavage. And by the way, here is a message to all the sweet men. Luckily, there are. It doesn't mean that you can't give me compliments. I do encourage that, and I like that. But seriously, as female politicians, we will never endure. We will never tolerate a hostile work environment. And that is why, six months ago, I signed with 120 Belgium MPs an open letter condemning sexism in politics to ignite a hashtag MeToo movement in Belgium. When is it the time for hashtag MeToo in politics? The answer is very simple. When we all decide that enough is enough. We have to break the ultimate taboo at the highest level of our democratic system. The political world was um, designed by men. It was designed for men. The professional culture itself is sexist and macho. And we all know that has to change. In that open letter, we proposed the creation of an independent body for all sorts of violence in politics. It is crucial that victims have a place, that they have a secret place to run. The world of politics, of course, is nowhere different than, other, than any other industry or corporation. It is a macho world in which women can also display macho behavior. We all need sisterhood. We already told that so many times. And let me hereby quote Madeleine Albright. She said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. It is also a problem that in many parliaments there is no code around harassment and transgressive behavior for MPs. My colleague Ilian and I set ourselves the goal to become the most gender-friendly parliament in Europe towards 2030. We ordered an audit. We ordered a strategic vision and an action plan for gender mainstreaming within our parliament. We recommended first measures such as a code of conduct. Practical, simple measures which we can already take and which can help us move step by step in the right direction. If each one of us would only sweep our own doorstep, the whole world would be clean, a wise woman once said. So let us all begin by cleaning our own doorstep. Let's learn, let's learn from each other and let us each do what we can. And finally, a last comment and thought. Why did we remain silent for so long about that sexist culture? First of all, I think, because we are afraid of our career. But most of all, we are often faced by disbelief. Sometimes we feel alone and we feel isolated with our stories to tell. We were told that maybe we were being too sensitive, that maybe we were imagining it, that maybe we were overreacting. Endure the pain, girl. Stop complaining. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. 
But when 120 women MPs stand up together with the same stories, with the same burning feelings, there is no longer an argument for denying the truth. And above all, as women political leaders, we are not standing up for ourselves. We are, above all, standing up for all women. We owe all women to keep speaking up. It would be a big, a very big fault to remain silent because silence does not solve a thing. So let us raise awareness. Let us support each other. Let us share our stories. Let's act because together we are strong. Together we are unstoppable. Be a lady, they said. Fuck off. Who do you think? <laughs> Who do you think you are? I say. Just be yourself. I thank you. Thank you, Stephanie Doz. Yes. <laughs> With that said, one thing I'm going to ask you all to chant right now, it is time. It is time. Let me hear you say it. It is One more time. It's not your time. It's not my time. It's our time. Wow. Unfortunately, we don't have all day to have a party in here, so we have to keep things moving. But thank you very much, Stephanie, for waking us up and getting us to understand that we are the change the world doesn't know it needs, but that the world needs. What does sexism in politics? Policy focus sessions are also happening. I would like to mention very quickly that we have two policy focus sessions running parallel to our next panel, which is sexism in politics. Um, if you registered for these sessions, this announcement is for you. The first is ending the stigma in politics on menopause, and that's happening in room B. Room B, please put up your hand. So if you've registered for ending the stigma in politics on menopause, Room B is there waiting for you. Or if you registered for the World Bank, creating a robust gender strategy, Room D is also waiting for you. B there, D, D and B, all that person. Okay, thank you very much. So my colleague will lead you to the rooms if you s registered for those sessions. Thank you so much. And now to our next, our third panel, which is sexism in politics. Women are underrepresented in political leadership roles and remain subject to discrimination, harassment, and unequal treatment. Allow me to bring our moderator for this session, Chief Policy Correspondent, Politico, Sarah Wheaton. Sarah, thank you very much. And Sarah will be joined by the member of House of Representatives from Indonesia, Puteri Aneta Kumarudin. We're also joined by member of the European Parliament, Karen Melchior, the Deputy National Assembly of Argentina, Camila Crescimendi, will be joining as well. Terry Reintke, who is the member of the European Parliament and co-president of Greens, is joining. Last but definitely not the least, Joyce Grant, President, National Alliance Party of Papua New Guinea, also joins this panel. So over to you, Sarah Wheaton. Thanks for having me. Thanks to our panel. Um, I'm going to be transparent that we are trying to make up for a bit of a lost time. So we are just going to have 25 minutes. So be a bit more of a, of a tour de table. 
Um, and also, uh, many of us are pressed today, and um, unfortunately, Terry cannot stay for, for so long, but we're very glad to have her. And so, I am going to start with you. So, you are a co-leader of one of the political groups in Parliament. It's pretty high, high rank for a woman, for a young woman. What is your secret for blasting through the glass ceiling? Well, um, first of all, it's great to be here and it's fantastic to see so many women leaders in the same room from all over the world. Uh, I think it's really a fantastic atmosphere and I don't think I have a special secret. I think I have basically used a very important tool that all of us have and that was um, that I worked together with other women in politics, uh, used the networks that I had, worked together and with this form of solidarity, it made it possible for me not only to enter politics but then also when I was in the European Parliament I was elected already nine years ago I was the youngest female parliamentarian at that time with 27 uh, and I think because I worked together also across political groups political parties with other women um, I managed to really build a strong political fundament and this is something that I have learned because I think all the backlash, the opposition, the challenges that we are facing when we are, you know, going, entering into the political realm, um, if we work together and if we really see the structural uh, reasons that this has, uh, and not only as an individual problem, this can really help to empower not only women politicians individually, but to really change a still male-dominated patriarchal system. So I would always say, of course, I've put a lot of heart and soul into uh, what I do politically, but I think it was also the very strong women around me that empowered me and made it possible to be where I am today. And just to anticipate a theme that will, that will come up perhaps after you leave, we have this challenge of, of women in leadership and sometimes the, the, the skills or the personal style that have, that have allowed men to kind of get where they are don't work for women, either because the kind of back slapping that men do, uh, we haven't kind of had the access to those networks or then the more kind of hard charging thing um, maybe isn't, isn't respected. Um, have you have you had to contend with this issue in your sort of uh, in your career? Absolutely, and I think still today I don't know how you feel, but you know when I was elected to the European Parliament, and we have a Parliament sitting where in the front rows you have the M MEPs, and then a little bit further back you have assistants or you know people who are coming from the outside that are sitting there. And when I was going to the front rows when I was elected. And there were ushers in the room and then they came to me and they said, oh yeah, the interns, they sit in the back of the room and the members of parliament, they sit here. So you still have this kind of uh, expectation that, you know, a politician, a powerful person is a man in a suit. Um, and I think that this is something that, of course, you can laugh over it, but it also creates this constant feeling that you are not in the place where you're supposed to be. And in my experience, you can only counter that if you not only you know, try to adjust your own behavior or also start wearing suits, you know, if you want to wear suits, totally fine, um, but if you also start challenging the reasons of why people assume that. And the reasons is that we still live in patriarchal societies where power is something that is um, you know, seen as something that is male, where the majority of the powerful positions are held by men, and if we don't work as women collectively together politically against these kind of structures, as individuals, we will always in the end be overwhelmed by the system. So for me, really, the lesson learned is we have to fight our own battles, absolutely, but we also have to work together to not have, you know, the next generation of women have exactly the same experience that we have had. And, and last question, what's, what's kind of one thing that you would ask your colleagues to do to support that next generation? Is there, is there a particular action or, or approach that is important? vote for women mm -hmm. and I don't only mean you know when you are going to vote but also I mean we were talking about this actually now in the European Parliament we have really managed to get more women elected to the European Parliament but the higher you look in terms of you know group leaders in terms of bureau of the Parliament the less women you have so also when you are in a position of power try to empower women to then take the responsibility because at the end of the day we don't only want to have 50% of women in Parliament we want them really to be in the powerful positions where the decisions are being taken so it goes for, from an election that you know you vote for a party or 
or a candidate to then, when you are in politics, support women around you, vote for them when they run to be group leaders, when they run to be presidents of parliaments, when they want to be ministers, support them and vote for them. Great, thank you so much, Terry. And if you need to hop, we, we totally... I will try to stay as long as possible because I really want to hear the other panelists as well. Um, so, Joyce, you are also the, the leader of a political party in Papua New Guinea. Um, I mean, so your country is just doing great with women's representation, right? No problems. Uh -huh. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, greetings from Papua New Guinea, perhaps from Oceania, Pacific Islands, my sister Tuvalu. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to, to be here. Um, it's the first time Papua New Guinea has been uh, invited. So, um, yeah, women are doing really well. 1.67% representation in the floor of parliament. We have a parliament that has 118 seats, of which only two are occupied by women. So it is dismal, but please bear with us. I totally agree with my sister here where we come from a society which is predominantly it's patriarchal. Everything is male dominated. It goes right down systematically, right down to our culture where it affects our, our society in the, in, the, in the way we are brought up, where women have their place and uh, men have their place. And even though we have a matrilineal society, which I have a privilege of coming from, women do lead. Uh, we still have to subject ourselves to the male that goes before. And it's something that's been culturally ingrained into us. Uh, perhaps as we go into the next 21st century, 22nd century, we need more education. Um, in order for us to fast, check, fast track the representation of women in our society in the, ocean, uh, in the Pacific area, we really need to appreciate a woman's place and the woman's place is in the house. We say that we say that confidently, but in my country, where else women still uh, do not represent at the national level, we do, I must say, uh, take ownership of the private sector. We are in many positions of authority in the background. And it's half of the problem is you can get a woman to uh, represent, but she first has to put her hand up. And when you have an environment where sexism is so, um, so um, violent. We're still struggling from um, trying to manage our people. Um, dealing with witchcraft. Really? That's the lack of education we have in our society, where women are still being tortured, women are still being burnt, killed, an average of 150 cases a year. So it's almost every three or four days, every month. So, sorry for being emotional. So when you try to compare why we don't get represented, it would be nice for everyone to appreciate where we come from. Something that's been ingrained into our culture. I come from just eight, uh, nine million people, but in there we have over 850 languages, the second largest country in the world that has so many uh, languages, the culture and the diversity of our people. The, uh, we're one of the least developed nations in the world. Yet, we were the first woman to vote in 1964. That's part of our history. We have um, agricultural setups that were b date back thousands of years. We have all of that knowledge in the background, but to appreciate a woman's place to be able to contribute, to, to, to drive that policy that women are important, unfortunately, we can own it in the back, but we can't own it in the front. Mm -hmm. So perhaps at this juncture, maybe I would like to ask, perhaps we could seek support mm -hmm. for more education, for more training programs for our women, for our people, because the truth of the matter is, yes, women own 49% of the vote in my country, and yet, it's not that the women don't support the women. It's they are afraid to support women as well. So you need women that can stand up. For example, last year, our general elections, 3,400 men stood for the 118 seats. Guess how many women stood? 146 women. 
The interesting thing about it is of the 146 women, 62 of them were endorsed by political parties, something that I take great um, uh, pride in because I've been a political staffer for over 20 odd years and it was difficult to exist in that space. Male dominated. At one point I had 46 members of parliament, all male. I was the non-parliamentarian and the only female in the room. So all the jokes, all the innuendos, all those horrible, horrible things that we talk about. My, my mentor, who happens to be obviously a male, Ted used to say to me, grow thick skin, my sister, because mm. you have no choice. So on, a, on this note, I'd also like to say a shout out to all the male champions. <laughs> male champions, thank you. I sit here today because of male champions. Not just women. Yeah, when there when there are not women to yes. be above you to be mentors, then, then we have to we yeah. have to. Sorry, I could go on, but yeah. I will not. They, I will. They, yeah. um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Camila, you've also seen this collision of kind of the private sphere space, space and your public sphere role and confronted the need to, when some people would be expected to just have a thick skin or a stiff upper lip, can you, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what, and what you learned from it? Yeah, well, I have to go personal because it's what's happening to me. I'm 33, I have a daughter who's two years and a half, Juana, and I was pregnant with uh, twin babies. I'm an MP in Argentina, and I was about to give birth uh, around the, seven, the eighth month. Uh, they were identical twins. I was already in the hospital and one of my baby's uh, heart stopped beating, so one of them died right before birth, uh, Silvestre. My baby Rufino is here with me, of course, because he comes with me everywhere, I still breastfeed him. And I was an MP, I am an MP. I was on supposed obvious maternity leave. I was mourning, my baby was in uh, the um, healthcare unit for 40 days because he was uh, severely injured. And I had to go to Congress because there was no license system, because my vote was needed and no one could replace me. It was absurd, ridiculous, right? You know, how, how clear does it have to get that we need to be protected to be able to keep going? I went to Congress the day before I broke my waters because I didn't have a maternity leave before the time of, of uh, because I was ahead of my, my due dates and I had to go and I couldn't session uh, from a distance and I had to go again. And I learned a lot of things from this experience and I'm still learning. When I went to the budget voting, um, I received as much support as I had ever got because I cried live, because I was going through the hardest, I'm still going through the hardest thing I think, and not, a, not just a woman, any person can have or live that's the death of, of, a, of a child. And I cried and I showed my emotions and I'd always been taught that being strong was to keep your emotions out of the room because that's meant to be in the domestic sphere because that's where it's supposed to be, especially if you're a woman. And I received so many messages, more than I'd ever have. I've been in politics from, since ever I was a very young girl. I've, been the, the youth leader in my party, got uh, elected at 25, then 27. I never got as much support, and people said, you're such a strong woman. And they thought they saw me as a strong woman because I was putting my life out there. Not only they could connect with the human in me, but also with the feelings. And I think there's a lesson there to be learned. It's not just being strong. It's not just about being strong, right? Power is power everywhere. Um, and sometimes you have to have a hard skin because you receive a lot of hostility, like many of you said before, it comes with a job and it's really hard. But showing that you're also going through hard times, sharing that with others, I think that's something we can also um, try to show as an example to other girls who are younger and who are growing with us. Not just for me, for my daughter and for all of our daughters and for all our sisters. We can be both things at the same time. Just one more remark. I received, like I said, thousands of, of messages of support and a few ridiculous people, just men, and a few women too, that said, 
but she's mourning. Go home and mourn. You have to be at home mourning. And who are you to tell me how to mourn and that I have to be at home? You have to be able to deal with pain too, right? That is something I feel, it's not just female, it's culturally female or, or feminized, you know, the, the emotions and being able, able to feel pain. I feel that's something that we also have to be very open with and be careful with sexism because that's also part of who we are. And maybe in these polarized times and hard times for democracies, being able to show there's much more than just strength or domination Leadership is also about being able to cope with your feelings. I feel that's a big lesson I'm learning, and I just wanted to share it with you all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, push. Thank you so much, Terry. No, no, you have an important job. You've got to go, you gotta go do your work. We all, I mean, we all do here, so. <laughs> um, is there... In general, kind of, I think social media has has created more pressure for for public personalities in general to show more emotion, to be more, um, to have more self disclosure. So, on the one hand, you know, as you said, that ended up quite being being quite an important and transformative moment for you that you got the support at a time that you were very open about what was going on with you personally. But on the other hand, and I would put this question to our other panelists, like, how much do women owe? The po women politicians owe the public of their of their sort of internal life, and do women owe? Does the public see women as owing more of that than men owe? Just a brief comment on that. I f I always usually think it's about being free. It's the same thing about maternity leaves. It's freedom for women to decide. So if you want to put your feelings out there, you have to be able to do it. And if other people can't cope with it, especially men who are like this, they're cr you're crying, or you're breastfeeding, and they're like this. Well, it's your problem, it's not mine. I'm a woman, I'm working, I've been in politics, I'm choosing this, and I also want to be a leader like you, so if you can't bear to watch me, it's your problem, not mine. So freedom, usually it's freedom. Freedom to keep going with your maternity leave if you really want to do it, or come back early if you really need your time because you want to be back, or you need that, or you feel like you want to do it. Same with your public or in personal life. It's about what you really feel like doing. It's, I think it's getting rid of the huge mandates and, and kind of the, the, the very unconscious things we've always been learning and being able to see, okay, so this is me. Who do I wanna be? And how do I wanna engage with people? And in my experience, being honest about who you are, it's, sometimes it's hard at the beginning, but it's always better and it's always better if you want to keep going, because otherwise it's just like a short run, you pull yourself out there, and then it's so terrible and so exhausting and so hostile that you end up going, doing something else. Um, so I think it's about, well, all of this. Sorority, the support of other women around you. When I was uh, having this experience, I had so much support from women around the world, and my own colleagues presented a bill to uh, uh, grant maternity leaves for not just uh, women deputies, but for everyone. So I got this support. And answering your question, I think it's about freedom. Being able to choose what you want to be, who you want to be, with your uh, sisters around, and um, without mandates or trying to get rid or, or being liberated from what people expect you to do. Mm -hmm. But Terry, how, how have you been kind of navigating these issues in Indonesia? Um, can I? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, dear sisters and brothers. Um, Indonesia is um, so much more like um, every other country that has pre uh, presented earlier. Indonesia is a patriarchal society, and I am a double minority. I was 26 when I was first elected. I'm 29 now. I just gave birth a month ago, uh, not a month ago, a year ago. And um, I was back in the office, so I can relate uh, really um, to what you just told us. I was back in the office five days after I gave birth. It was a normal birth, and fortunately, my baby was healthy, and um, I had to uh, return to the office because one of my seniors um, called me and said that now that you have give birth, um, go back to your duties, and if you cannot do it, then we can replace you with the other members. And I'm currently seated in the one of the most senior, so-called senior um, committee in the Indonesian parliament. Um, it's House Commission 11, we over, which oversees uh, national development, um, planning, banking, finance, and only um, 
six uh, women members are present at the moment and the others 50, 50 out of 56 are all male. And I have no choice, so I had to go back to the um, office and start um, pumping. Um, so I, I am still currently breastfeeding my child. Uh, my, my baby is in Indonesia at the moment. I, I kept all the breast milk in the freezer. I pumped everywhere. Even my colleagues from Iceland just now, um, she saw me uh, pumping. And I want to normalize this, you know. Uh, we are not... It's, it's not a sin for us to want to become a mother and want to be a good politician as well. Um, the first comment that I got when I uh, pump in, uh, in the middle of a plenary session, of course I have my nursing cover and it's, it's not porno per se, but one of, the, <laughs> one of the male colleagues told me that, oh, I have a coffee here, it's a black coffee, do you want to give me some of your milk? I was like, oh my God, you're... you're you're like, the, the, you're as old as my father. And that is the first thing that you said to me when in fact, his daughter was just gave birth as well. And that, that kind of respect that we should get, and um, I get emotional every time I talk about this. And so I can relate to what Terry says as well. This is the kind of um, life that we have to endure as a politician and it becomes normal. So when I arrived here and I heard all of the inspiring stories from all of you, it becomes clear that, you know, I am not alone. I, I shared this with, you know, my sisters all across the globe. So um, maybe um, just by maintaining my position in the parliament and in the party and, um, you know, not not surrendering to the pressure from all the senior male politicians in my country and showed my juniors that, you know, this career is possible and it is possible for you to have kids and to have normal life and family. Maybe this is like um, a good start for us in Indonesia. Thank you. We're, um, just to add a bit, um, we're currently 21%, 21 percent, 21.57 um, in the parliament, and there's a woman chairing the Defense and Foreign Affairs um, Committee, and there's a woman chairing the Healthcare and Workforce Committee. So I think um, we are going there, but with all the sexist comments and all, I think uh, we're we still have a lot of homework to do. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to warn our organizers and I'm going to run five minutes past, uh, past the point that I that I said we would at the beginning. Um, uh, Karen, I want to, I'm hoping you can help us address maybe something that is, is uncomfortable, which, you know, we've been talking about how women leaders are sort of navigating their private and their, and their public lives, um, but we've seen some maybe hiccups in, in women's style sort of adjusting to gaining power. Um, my news organization, Politico, did a, did a look at, at um, workplace bullying cases in the European Parliament, and I was even a little uncomfortable that it looked like many of the cases, most, oops, sorry, most of the cases were complaints about women MEPs, MEPs of color, of which there are extraordinarily few, and it's hard for me to believe that it's really, that like women suck at managing political offices. Um, what do you think might be going on there? Well, I mean, we're not all born leaders and managers enough, and you need to, like, settle into the role. But I think, I mean, as Terry said earlier, we need to also look at sort of this as a structural issue. I think we have, we haven't reached equality in Europe, in the European Parliament, and not even in, in Northern Europe. And I think we now have a discussion about women being politicians and mothers at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the next frontiers is also what are the expectations that we have of women and men as managers and as politicians? Because when you walk into a room, whether you're wearing a suit or a flowery dress, you will be seen as a woman. And that means that the expectations that people that are with you are different than if you were a man. So if you then fall outside of those expectations, if you respond in a way that they didn't expect, then the backlash will be stronger than it, because you fall outside of the expectation. As a woman, you're often expected to be very motherly and embracing and come with freshly baked cakes for the office. And if you don't do that, then you're falling outside of the expectation. 
and that will provide a, a backlash. Luckily, we have a debate in Denmark and in Europe about the culture and politics, and also about Me Too in politics, at least in Denmark. And I think this is very welcome. But I think, as you mentioned, it is surprising that the complaints that sort of reach um, the official structures are often uh, for women politicians and politicians of color. And sometimes you feel like if you, as a political party, say that you want women politicians on your list, is it really something that you as a political party truly want? Or do you only want them on the ballot to show that you have women candidates? And you want them in your delegation and your political group, but only if they don't take the men's jobs. And I think we haven't quite uh, reached a, a situation where women are allowed to actually challenge the power structures in political parties and the men uh, holding the jobs. And one of the ways of fighting your women competitors is by addressing if people have experienced them not living up to the sort of mother figure that you're expected to hold as a woman. Mm -hmm. And it is incredibly difficult to be accused of being an unempathetic uh, boss and a manager and a leader especially if you think that this is something that is important and that we need to be able to address. And as, a, as an employer and a manager, you can't go out and sort of back, you can't go out and sort of criticize your own, own employees in the media. Mm -hmm. But, and that means that you're left in a very vulnerable position as a politician because you're being attacked, but you cannot even explain the nuances of the situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, last question for each of you in, in like one, one sentence, please. Um, Karen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce right back to you. Given what you know now, a most important piece of advice to your younger self when you first were contemplating running for office. Go for it. Do it. Uh, build alliances, build networks, show more of yourself, and also um, talk w more with, with media and social media about what's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I would say keep going. Uh, let them deal with it. Stay in the room if it's just you, you're the only woman. Stay in the room. Next time it's going to be more than one. Bring a sister in. Uh, keep going. Don't feel, because uh, it reproduces itself. If you leave the room, it's happened to me so many times, so we, the only woman in the room, stay there. Bring one more woman in, then there will be three, and then there will be more, more women than men usually because we're really good, great leaders. <laughs> Joyce. Yeah, I would uh, like to remind myself that uh, politics is a long haul. So it's, I always like to say it's not a 100 meter race, it's a marathon. And so you've got to pace yourself, and you've got to get the wins when you can, and you've got to let some things go sometimes. And you've just got to be consistently there. So that's what I felt. I, my contribution in my political space in Papua New Guinea, I've been there. I'm the longest serving executive of over 25 years, 22 years. I feel that if you don't stick yourself out, you will not be counted. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you. stick it out. Yeah, thank you. Um, my father always said, um, politics stays here, not here. So um, that's what keeps me going until this moment. And I think I'm going to say to my younger self that be perseverance, befriend everyone, because you need the media, you need the male colleagues, you need everyone to be your allies so you can be up there, like Joyce said just now. So we wouldn't be able to live here alone, of course. We need uh, male allies in our parliament, but I think it would be possible with all the great sisters I have here. So thank you. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us. Thank you very much, Sarah, for moderating that very powerful conversation, sexism in politics. Please, another round of applause for our panelists who shared very personal accounts of their experiences in politics and, of course, finished up the conversation on a high with possible solutions to every single problem. Thank you very much, panelists. I know you don't want to leave, but you do have to leave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Ladies having a little bit of fun? All right.
thank you too. And now, what I would like to call a highlight for this morning as we go into the completion of the first part of the day, she is widely, globally celebrated as a transformative effect or effector on Ireland. At the time when she was president, she was known to change a lot of policies. So much so that she became what one may say is Ireland's most popular president to date. Now we all know her as a fighter for human rights, but I think one of the things that I saw her do, which showed me that she is a woman of courage and clearly she has probably had her own fair share of the experiences we heard today is how she nodded to every single story. She may have seen some, felt some, I don't know. But what I do know is her presence here gives us the legitimacy of women political leaders being one of the organizations that will highlight what every single woman in politics needs to know and needs to be. Allow me to welcome to the podium none other than the chair, adjunct professor for climate justice, Trinity College Dublin, and the president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, of course, she is in the person of Her Excellency, Mary Robinson. Well. <laughs> oh, please. You know, getting a standing ovation before you speak is deadly. <laughs> but thank you for that very warm introduction. And I'm really delighted to be here, be back with women political leaders. Um, and uh, to change the subject a bit, that was a great panel, and I was nodding to a lot of the points being made. But I want to actually have a call to action, and it's a call to action from the bottom of my heart. I'm living this now. I'm living the fact that we have a climate and nature crisis, but we don't treat it as a crisis. So it's become what we call a communications crisis. And it's very real. Um, I was the special envoy of the Secretary General um, Ban Ki-moon before the Paris climate agreement. And I saw how we got the reference to 1.5 degrees in the text. It came about because Tony de Brum, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, was in with the ministers in all the preparatory meetings. And he kept saying, we have to get 1.5 into the text because otherwise my islands will be gone, my small atolls in the Pacific. I will no longer be a sovereign nation. Is that what you want? Is it, do you want to actually get rid of a sovereign country? And then in the street you had indigenous peoples and young people and civil society and even some progressive business marching to the mantra, and some of you may remember it, 1.5 to stay alive. 1.5 to stay alive. And we got a new goal in the Paris Agreement that the world should commit to staying well below two degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial standards when the Industrial Revolution started and work for 1.5 degrees. But actually, the scientists had never studied this, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Scientists that issue all these reports. So they had to do a special report, which they did shortly after Paris, well, a few years after Paris, in October 2018. They brought out a report and they said, actually, there is a very real difference between two degrees and 1.5 degrees, and it worries us enormously, because we've seen now that between 1.5 and two degrees, and at the moment, we're above 1.1, and heading for 1.2, and some parts of the world are already at 1.2 because it's not evenly uh, spread. They said 
between 1.5 and 2 degrees, bad things may happen. For example, the Arctic ice may completely disappear. The coral reefs may disappear. And the permafrost, and there's a great deal of permafrost around the Arctic and, uh, and Siberia, etc., may melt and throw up not just carbon, but methane, which is actually more lethal in the shorter term. So the scientists said very clearly, and they've repeated it ever since, the whole world has to stay at or below 1.5 degrees of warming, or we will not have a livable world. And they said, in order to do that, we have to reduce by 50% carbon emissions by 2030, global carbon emissions by 2030. And they've repeated this in every report, and they get more and more intensive about it because we're not on course. A lot of good things are happening. We're seeing clean energy be much cheaper. Um, we're seeing wind power and um, solar power um, and battery retention and green hydrogen. Lots of exciting innovations are happening, and that's moving. So there's a sort of paradox. We're, we're kind of on the cusp of a clean energy safe world for everyone, and probably a much fairer world, because if you take the continent of Africa, which I'm more familiar with than um, other uh, developing continents, um, you've 900 people um, uh, in Africa who still use dirty cooking and ingest the fumes of charcoal or animal dung or wood, and um, a, a very significant number die every year. Um, they would have clean energy. Um, the 600 million in their homes that don't switch the switch um, in Africa would also um, uh, have access to clean energy because that's the idea of clean energy for all. But actually, instead of making the steps that the scientists have looked for, that we cut emissions by 50% by 2030, um, we're heading in a very worrying direction. And it was the same calculation at the Glasgow summit over a year ago and at the Sharm El Sheikh Egyptian summit last November. I was at both. And I actually, I actually cried publicly when I heard in Glasgow that if you add up all the promises that governments make and parliaments make, all the pledges that corporations and investors make, in moving in the right direction towards clean energy, if you add them all up, we're still heading for a 2.4 degree world of warming this century, which is catastrophic, which will not be livable. And, you know, we don't talk about it. We don't, you know, talk to our neighbors about it. We don't talk about it in our workplace. We don't even talk about it enough in our parliaments. We don't treat this as a crisis. And so a number of women called Connected Women Leaders came together last year, and we felt we have to you know, think about this in terms of how do we deal with this crisis. And we came to two conclusions. One, it's a communications crisis, and we have to break through. And we noted that there's a very large budget on the other side of this, a budget that is continuing to support what is harming us, which is the use of coal, oil, and gas. We have to transit out of it, but it's harming us because it's contributing to the emissions. And billions are being spent every year to promote in various ways that it's compatible, that we need it, that it's good for poor countries, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's worse than the tobacco industry and the money that was spent on the tobacco industry. It muddies the science, it muddies the thing, and it, it's a constant budget spent deliberately to continue to use coal, oil, and gas. Now, there's an agency that you'll know, the International Energy Agency, and it has said we should have no new fossil fuel um, entities in our world. And that's what was a very conservative body, but the head of it, Fatou uh, Biral, um, has read the science and understands 
and he is urging uh, as I'm urging. Um, so that's the first thing, that um, there's a communications problem because all the communications, all the money is spent persuading us to continue to use what is harming us. And then the other side of the thing is we believe that it's women power that's going to have to break through on this. Um, women power that is smarter. It won't have the huge budgets of the coal, oil, and gas, but it can be very smart about realizing, making the point, for example, that women and, and children suffer most from the shocks of climate, whether it's intense heat, whether it's flooding, whether it's um, uh, you know, unpredictability for farmers of um, the, the, the rainy season doesn't come. Every country now is suffering from climate shocks. We're seven years away from um, 2030. You know, in 2018, it seemed a long time away. Now it's seven years away. So we're into what we call Earthshot time. And we didn't like the moonshot of John F. Kennedy as an example because it was very male, very technical, competitive against Russia, military in a, in a sense. Um, so we had to dig deep and think, what's the feminist equivalent? What's the equivalent that women can embrace? And we came up with what I call Project Dandelion. I was going to use slides to, to illustrate. I've never used a PowerPoint, and I was terrified. And so I have, we're not using the slides. But those slides are available, and I'd love if uh, Silvana was um, I share them with anybody who'd like to see them, which kind of makes the case in a very professional way that I'm making to you from the heart. Um, the uh, extraordinary thing is that uh, a huge amount of investment goes into subsidizing fossil fuel. Now, the good news is countries are realizing that they have to stop that. And Interestingly, Nigeria, for example, has decided not to subsidize fossil fuel. And, you know, in other words, what I'm trying to get across is it is doable that we can reduce by 50% carbon emissions by 2030. It's doable, but we're not at all on course to do it. Um, so what we need to do is to treat the crisis as a crisis. And that's difficult, and that's why I'm so pleased to talk to you. I was a member of the Irish Senate for 20 years before I was elected president in December 1990. And I know that, you know, it's difficult to get re-elected if you've taken really hard decisions. <laughs> you know, I see a nodding of some heads. Um, and our democratic systems don't lend themselves to looking a bit more long-term and taking those tough decisions. So, Democracy itself is, is a bit of a problem here because we absolutely need to take those decisions because you cannot negotiate with science. Um, and the scientists, the global scientists, are telling us over and over again, and those reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are agreed by all the governments, including China, including Russia, including every country that's part of the um, uh, of the, uh, the system, 193 countries, they agree the executive summary, which is the one we all read, the rest is too detailed and too scientific. We all read the executive summary, and governments have agreed it. So they have agreed that we have to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. But we're not on course. And, um, you know, I'm of the view that what will make the difference? It's the pressure of um, the, the widest possible movement around Project Dandelion. Why Dandelion? And I'm going to come to an end very soon. Dandelion is a flower, or certainly in my country, a weed, usually, that grows on all seven continents. It's very resilient. If you've ever tried to get rid of it off your lawn or off your thing, it's very difficult because it has deep roots. It's very regenerative. You can eat every part of a dandelion, and it's used in teas and in soups in many countries and, and considered to be extremely healthy. I've discovered it's very popular as a flower in China, which I was quite pleased to hear. Um, and 
How do you spread it? You blow the seeds. You know, children love to blow the dandelion seeds. And what we want to do is create a light touch platform of all of the people who are working on the right side of this. And that includes an extraordinary number of women working at local level to make their community more resilient, to address um, the issues of um, uh, flooding, to address issues of um, um, uh, changing to more nature-based solutions. Um, it, it's really, really important that we see that there is a groundswell of movement that is going with the fact that uh, clean energy is getting so much cheaper. So somehow um, we've got to build a momentum that helps politicians, and you're all politicians as far as I'm concerned, you're members of parliament, um, uh, helps to actually take those hard decisions. And of course, it's the countries that are most responsible, the industrialized countries that built their economies on fossil fuel. We're the ones that have to move fastest. Um, you know, in my own country, Ireland, the head of our environmental protection agency went on our television and radio um, in recent days and said, we have very good climate legislation. We're supposed to, under the European Union um, uh, momentum, we're supposed to reduce Ireland's emissions by 51% by 2030. Here's the story. We're on course for 29% at the moment. 29%, not 51%. And that's true of most countries. It's very true, for example, of the United States. It's not on course. It's on course to move very fast into clean energy, which is good. The, um, um, the IRA legislation, which Irish people find a very strange name, but we know it's the... Um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's basically a, cl a climate legislation for clean energy. Um, it is, is moving the needle very fast, but the United States is not cutting its emissions at the rate it needs to. The European Union is a bit better, but needs to get to that 55%, not 51, 55% to really fulfill um, its uh, responsibility as one of the ma major areas um, of emissions. And, you know, how are we going to get this in, to be a crisis? We have to talk about it. We have to talk about it in our family, in our community, in our parliament, in our neighborhoods. And we have to understand that it, this is not negotiable, that we actually have a responsibility for our children and grandchildren, our nephews and nieces, and their children and grandchildren. And we're not heading for a safe world. We're heading for a world, um, it's not just the emissions which I've been focusing on, it's also the nature-based solutions. Um, I'm very involved with um, very good scientists who are mapping what they call the planetary boundaries. There are nine planetary boundaries, and we're exceeding on about six of them at the moment, and probably seven, um, into the red, in other words. Um, so, um, it's women who have to change this, as happened in Paris when you had the marches in the street and Tony de Bruyne inside in the chamber with the other ministers saying, we have to get 1.5 into the text. Well, we've got the 1.5, but we're not doing it. We're not doing it. So we need to go back to that mantra of 1.5 to stay alive, and we've got to reduce by 50 percent by um, 2050. And um, I'm, my major work and, and hat at the moment is as chair of the elders, the group of independent um, former whatevers. Not all of us um, are um, people who've been, there are a number of former presidents, former secretary general, and we had uh, Kofi Annan as a previous chair, and our first chair was Archbishop Tutu. Um, uh, but um, we, we deal with three existential threats, the climate and nature, crisis, the nuclear crisis, and the pandemic crisis. And we're really very aware that of the three, the climate and nature crisis is probably the most serious in that unless we change course before 2030. You hear a lot about being um, 
net zero by 2050. A lot of countries are saying this, and it's a kind of way of putting it off. But if the scientists tell us, if we haven't reduced our carbon, global carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, it's almost impossible, almost literally impossible to catch up in the second part. It's so much more difficult. So in, in many ways, the easier part is to do it and do it as quickly as possible. And uh, that's why it's an earth shot. It seems impossible. And yet, we do want a future, don't we? I mean, we do want to see our children and grandchildren and nephews and nieces and their children and grandchildren having a world that's livable. I'll finish on one point. My second climate mandate was in 2016. I was the special envoy of the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, um, on El Nino and climate. We are being told, and some of you I'm sure are aware of this, that there is a strong likelihood, something like 80% likelihood now, of an El Nino towards the end of this year and into 2024. And some scientists are saying, actually, that may mean that in the short term, we will actually go up to the 1.5, or maybe slightly over the 1.5 um, degrees, which is really frightening, because people will die of heat in particular, and there will be massive flooding. It will be very bad. The reason I say that is 2016 is the worst year, the hottest year, and the worst climate year so far because of El Nino. And we are heading into an El Nino. So um, I'm trying not to scare people in that sense, and yet we have to wake up. We have to, as women, take our responsibility. And Nelson Mandela famously said, it always seems impossible until it is done. It is almost impossible in abstract terms to actually achieve that target of reducing by 50% and restoring nature by 2030. But if women all over the world, political women, business women, indigenous women, young women, actually indigenous women and young women are already there. They're already saying what I'm saying over and over again and calling on us, begging us to listen. If we can form a huge women-led, but not women only. We need supportive men. We need artists. We need scientists. We need um, you know, creative people. We need entrepreneurs. But um, it has to be women-led because it's a crisis. And it almost seems impossible, but it will be done. Please, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, another round of applause for Mary Robinson. One more time. Bringing all of us to our feet because of your exceptional and exemplary leadership, WPL congratulates you. Thank you very much. Wow. I want to be Mary Robinson when I grow up. <laughs> and now ladies, we are ready for first of all, our family photo. Our family photo, we've got our ushers who will take us to where the family photo is being taken. Immediately after we have lunch. Now I know that we've spent a lot of time in this room, but I'm going to ask that we be very disciplined with our time. I know we also want to network, but we absolutely have to be back in this room at 2.15 p.m. Now, I would like to say a big thank you to the Federal Parliament um, for sponsoring and providing us lunch. Thank you very much. And also that lunch will take place at the presidential reception room of the summit. So the presidential reception room, we've got our ushers waiting to take us there. So ladies, two at 2.10, I'll be reminding each and every one of you individually. But first, our family photo, our, our ushers will take us there. Can we leave our, our things here?
One, two. Ladies, I'm going to ask us to move out for the family photo. I know we all want to take photos in order for us not to lose any more time. May I kindly and respectfully request that we move for the family photo. Thank you very much. Yes. The ushers are waiting to help us to move for the family photo. If I may kindly ask us to move very quickly so that we can have lunch and be back in the hall. Please follow the ushers. They are over there. All the ushers are to my right and they will take us to the hall where we will have the family photo. If you could kindly move to through to the family photo. Thank you very much.